So hey guys, how are you all? Welcome to the Muse fanfiction. So we are back with a brand new movie on what if Naruto became the legendary sage of Dragon Realms. But before we start, be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Now let's begin the story. A roaring waterfall crashed down into a lake, underwater fish darted every which way avoiding predators, or dodging the shinobi jumping around the water in his underpants in his fruitless attempts to capture a fish. A R R R R R R R R R R G H H H H H H H H H Naruto screamed out in frustration. Damn fish! Naruto said lowly, his stomach growling agreeing with him, which grew Naruto's frustration. You damn fish! Naruto yelled out, pointing an accusing finger across the lake. There's no way you can outfox me, the great Naruto Uzumaki. The yell went unanswered as it echoed into the woods and was deafened by the waterfall. The only creature that gave Naruto any heed at his yell was a lone wolf giving him a canine equivalent of a raised eyebrow with its ears standing at attention. What are you looking at mutt? The wolf gave only a low whine before turning away and dashing off into the brush. Turning to the water, Naruto got an evil look in his eye and pulled out six kanai with each one tagged with an explosive seal. Yeah! With that yell Naruto threw kanai scattering them across the lake, each one hitting the bottom in a matter of seconds. And just then a faint glow emanated from the bottom of the lake sending the fish in the lake and water sailing sky high. Ha ha ha! See that's why you don't mess with Naruto Uzumak BBLLLER. Then before Naruto realized it, the water came back down in a seemingly concentrated stream solely on him, a few seconds later the water finished falling onto him. Naruto laid on the ground, completely knocked on his back. Grunting at the result the kanai had given him, sitting up he suddenly felt a procession of pinches all across his body, looking down Naruto found himself covered head to toe in crayfish, with them digging their claws right into his skin, causing Naruto to yell out in pain from the evil little crustacean's claws. After several minutes of painfully removing each and every crayfish, Naruto found himself next to a small fire, as he began cooking some of the fish that landed on the ground. His stomach began to growl some more as the aroma emitting from fish reached his nostrils, as they were nearly finished cooking. Just you wait a little longer, Naruto said to his eager stomach. Once the fish were cooked to perfection, he picked up each of the sticks that were skewered into the fish, and moved them away from the fire so they wouldn't overcook. After sticking each stick into the ground, Naruto held one of the fish on a stick near his mouth. He stared at it for a bit, wishing he had some seasoning to put on the fish. He slowly moved it towards his mouth, as his tongue started to water in anticipation. Just as he was about to take a bit, a hawk swooped down and took the fish right out of his hand. Naruto stared at his empty hand for a second trying to process what happened. Standing up Naruto shouted, Hey you damn bird! Give me back my fish before I skewer you two. In return, he received a screech from the hawk as it flew away. Oh, well, at least I have a few more. Naruto thought, as he sat back down and reached for one of the sticks. Just as his head touched the stick, he heard something rustle coming from the silent forest, causing him to retrace his hand as he looked in the direction the sound came from. After a while of seeing nothing coming out of the forest, he began to reach for another fish. Then he heard the noise once more looking in the same direction once more just in time to see a large man, with long white hair that reached his waist, run past him kicking up dirt and dust as he did. Coughing as dirt and dust filled his lungs, Naruto waited for it to settle. Once it did, Naruto glanced at his fish, only to find that they were trampled, and crushed. His mouth fell open as all of his hard work went to waste. His left eye began to twitch as anger filled his body, while he looked for the culprit who ruined his lunch. On the other side of the lake Naruto found who he was looking for, hiding behind a tree. Eyes burning with rage, he approached Jiraiya. Once he was behind him Naruto shouted. Hey watch where you're going next T.I. Naruto's voice was then muffled as Jiraiya covered Naruto's mouth and whispered. Shish, keep it down, will you? You're going to blow my cover. Jiraiya then returned his focus back to what he was looking at before. Looking in the same direction. Naruto saw what Jiraiya was staring at. Several yards away was another lake, with a few young ladies in bikinis running around and splashing one another as they played in the water. Anger filled Naruto's body until his face became red as he yelled, You pervy old sage. This yell took Jiraiya off guard, causing the old pervert to fall right through the bushes he was viewing the women from. 
The group taking notice of the yelling of pervert and a strange old man falling from the bushes caused them to run off screaming. Jiraiya, who had quickly recovered from Naruto's yell, called out to them, wait, please come back it was just getting good, his hand was reached out in, some comedic attempt to bring them back. Clenching his hand into a fist the toad sage made a beeline straight for Naruto running at mock speed. Naruto barely had any time to react to his sensei's anger as he was clocked right in his stomach, only to hear, you moron, being yelled by Jiraiya, before sailing and crashed into the nearby lake. What were you thinking? I was so close to finishing my book, Jiraiya yelled, anime tears streaming down his face. It was going to be such a good ending this time too. He sulked. I was following them for hours, whaggrhrhrgh, Jiraiya yelled, as Naruto came soaring out of the water and kicked him in the face sending the old pervert flying backwards into a tree. What the hell was that for brat? Jiraiya yelled. I don't freaking care about your damn book. Naruto yelled back pissed at his sensei. You are supposed to be training me, not being a pervert. As Jiraiya got up and dusted himself off, he walked up to Naruto who was giving him such a scowl the Kyubi might even reel back in fear. He dropped onto one knee and put a hand on Naruto's shoulder. Naruto you have to understand, he began in a stern voice, breaking Naruto's scowl. That my work keeps nations, villages, and even families together. He quickly pulled Naruto next to him as fixed his gaze on the sky and raised his fist toward the heavens. For you see Naruto, without my work the world would plunge into chaos by the lack of my book alone. Yeah right, Naruto said, trying to breaking free from Jiraiya's dramatic moment, but being unable to do so, as Jiraiya spun him around and sat him down in front of him. You may not believe me Naruto but I assure you, my work is quite certain to keeping Kohana safe. Naruto sighed. You're still not going to train me today, daughter you? Jiraiya laughed and patted Naruto on the head. You really only have a one-track mind don't you kid? Breathing in deeply Jiraiya looked at Naruto. Okay I'll tell you what brat, how about you let me finish up here and I'll teach you a very powerful secret technique. Really, you mean it, Naruto's eyes lit up completely forgetting Jiraiya's past failures for such promises. Yeah, just head back to camp, and I'll meet you there in an hour or two, Jiraiya said with a big grin. Yahoo, Naruto completely forgetting about his frustration at Jiraiya with the promise of a jutsu, and ran off without a second thought. As Naruto ran off Jiraiya was waving a mock goodbye, then when the orange blur was out of sight, he smiled. That will keep him off my back at least for the rest of the day, now where was I? Jiraiya smiled a prevy grin before running off in the direction of the women. About two hours later, late evening, Naruto sat on the ground arms crossed, legs crossed, and pissed. He had wait nearly two hours, for the pervert and he and tired of it, and rather bored for that matter. You are far too gullible you little brat, a dark voice muttered, breaking the young ninja away from his anger at his sensei. Who said that? Naruto asked in an unusually clam voice, slowly getting up he surveyed his surroundings for the source, with a kanai at the ready. Really you don't remember me? The voice asked in a mock hurt. I must say I am hurt. How can a landlord possibly forget his tenant? Naruto's eyes widened in fear and felt his stomach drop. K.Y. Kayubi. Naruto muttered in fright. Where are you? Did you get out of the seal? You really are an idiot aren't you? The Nine Tails questioned, but really didn't care for an answer. I'll put this flatly if I was out of this seal you. Would. Be. Dead. So you're still in the seal then how are you talking to me? I am in the seal, but I am also in your head dumbass. Kayubi stated. Where I can see all your little memories and secrets. Like when you painted the Hokage monument, and I must say myself the Hokage never looked better than on that day. Even though that comment was coming from a huge genocidal monster that lived inside of his stomach, it still made him smile. At least someone found it great, Naruto said aloud making him forget his fear of the fox for the moment, be that was short-lived and soon replaced with fear once more. And that girl you're in love with, the demon continued. So what it's no secret I'm in love with Sakura, ohohohohohohohoho. Kayubi laughed, I don't mean that little lie, I am talking about the little blue-haired o. All right shut up, Naruto yelled, stopping the Kayubi mid-sentence and sending several of the nearby wildlife running and flying away in panic. I'm not that dumb Kayubi, what do you want from me? 
Naruto asked knowing the chakra construct had something more on its mind than to just bug him. Naruto could feel the Kyuubi's sadistic smile through the metal barrier of the cage. Oh, not much but since your sensei is a no-show, I thought I would show you a powerful technique you already know, but don't know how to fully use. Uh, that doesn't make much sense, so much for being, not that dumb, huh, the nine tails taunted. Hey, Naruto shouted, which resulted in the Kyuubi laughing. So you game kit? The giant fox asked. Naruto thought about it for a short while before saying. Fine, I'll bite what? It's summoning. Okay, now I know your goal is nothing but messing with me, Naruto said, wishing now he had never engaged in conversation with the fox in the first place. It's not the toads I'm speaking of, I'm talking about your own summoning contract. Now this got Naruto's attention. Got him, Kayubi thought. What are you talking about? Naruto questioned. I mean you more on your own summoning contract, just as the toads belong to your perverted sensei, everyone has their own animal they link with best. And there are many summons who don't have a summoner yet. Your sensei discovered the toads this way, and just think of what you the great Naruto Uzumaki could find, the Kayubi said feeding Naruto's ego. He thought about this for a bit. Fine, so what do I do? Naruto said, fully coming into the Kayubi's temptation. Just preform the normal jutsu for summoning, but don't concentrate on summoning the toads. The demon said with a smile his plan moments away from coming into motion. Oh, and be sure to keep a clear mind doing this, but I doubt that will be very difficult for you. Rolling his eyes, Naruto began the summoning. He cleared his head and made the five hand seals, boar, bird, dog, monkey, and ram. Then quickly he raised his hand up into the air, and swiftly brought it down. Just as his hand was about to touch grass, he stopped and began to laugh. What is so damn funny? Perform the jutsu already, demanded Kayubi. Oh man I really had you going there didn't I now who is the dumb one? Naruto asked while laughing earning a growl from Kayubi. Once Naruto calmed down he laid back down and spread out his arms and legs before saying, Do you honestly think I would do anything you ask? I mean, what will you get out of all of this? Do I need a reason? Besides, don't you want to become stronger? asked Kayubi. Of course I want to get stronger, that is why I'm training with Jiraiya, besides what could I possibly learn that I can't learn right here? A way to find, Sasuke, and last time I checked your so-called teacher is nowhere to be found. Naruto sat still, gazing up into the sky thinking about what Kayubi said. Well I have nothing better to do, said Naruto, as he sat back up, once again, he cleared his mind and made the same five hand seals as before. Upon placing his hand upon the ground, a summoning cycle appears, followed by a large puff of smoke. When the smoke cleared from Naruto's vision, he saw that the lake he was standing next to was gone, and instead he was in a massive city, with buildings as tall as five Naruto's stacked on top of one another, and those only being the smallest of the many buildings. This however is not what caught Naruto's attention. All around him, stood what looked like moles, except they stood on two legs, most of which only came up to his waist. As Naruto stared back at them, he thought, where the hell am I? Viewing several reptilian creatures fly overhead. Where the heck am I? Naruto muttered unable to take everything, and what were those flying creatures? Well whatever they were they're awesome. He yelled a burst of enthusiasm coming from deep within his being, making the moles nearby gazing at this weird hairless cheetah, flinch in surprise. Naruto with a quick burst of power jumped into the air and onto a nearby roof. The mole's jaws dropped. Sure they usually saw giant flying lizards and the undead among other things. But seeing a random creature come nothing short of appearing out of thin air and jumping nearly 30 feet high was a bit much. Where'd they go? Naruto asked himself surveying the surrounding area trying to catch any signs of the flying beats, and was able to catch a slight glimpse of a green one heading toward the center of the city which seemed to be where a large temple of some sort stood. Naruto grinned and began heading toward it jumping from rooftop to rooftop, attracting a lot of attention along the way. About halfway there as Naruto jumped to the next roof a portal opened up right in front of him, unable to react to the quick event Naruto quickly tried swim backwards into the air to get away from it, but was doomed to be swallowed by it. Elsewhere, the orange shinobi was spat out onto a hard brick floor with mostly his face meeting it, Naruto groaned as his sat up, gazing at his surroundings. Oh great, now where am I? Naruto looked around the room, 
A blue fire crackled in the middle of the room. A small floating ball made of crystal hovered above it. Along the walls it was lined with bookshelf after bookshelf. I'd rather be the one asking the questions youngling. A voice said from behind Naruto. The young ninja whipped around coming face to face with a light blue version of the flying creatures he saw before, but he got a better look at this one. It stood on all fours and had two gigantic wings on its back, light blue scales covered its body, and a spear-like weapon sat connected to the creature's tail. It wore a rough red cloak draped on its back and necklace that held many crystals, hung around its neck. To say Naruto was impressed would be an understatement, but as well he was overwhelmed by the creature towering over him. You don't look like any creature born here, so who are you and how did you get here? The creature bellows scaring Naruto outright. Eheh, Naruto laughed slightly nervous. I really don't know I was just jumping from rooftop to rooftop and all of a sudden a portal opened in front of me, and I really couldn't dodge it so I just fell right in. The large lizard-like creature sighed before calmly saying, Yes I am well aware of how you got in this room. I am the one who brought you here in the first place. What I meant was how did you get here in the dragon realms? Dragon realms, thought Naruto. Is that what they're called, cool? Pushing these thoughts aside Naruto then said. My name is, Naruto Uzumaki. I come from Konohagakure, in the land of fire. I came here by performing a summoning jutsu without using a summoning scroll. Well, Naruto, my name is, Ignatus. I am the chronicler of this new era, said Ignatus proudly. Now I must ask, what is a jutsu? Well a jutsu is, hey wait a moment, shouldn't you know this already? Asked Naruto confused. Guessing by your title, I will presume that you are the leader, or deity of dragons, kind of like how, Gamabunta, is for the toads, so shouldn't you know what a jutsu is? I'm afraid that I don't know this, Gamabunta, of whom you speak of, but I only became chronicler merely two months ago and I have barely scratched the surface of the knowledge and duties I am supposed to preform," said Ignatus. Naruto could hear Kayubi snickering echo in his head. What's gotten you in such a giggly mood? Oh this is better than I could have ever planned, snickered Kayubi. I don't get it what is so funny, asked Naruto. You really are an idiot kid. Mr. Scales over there has no idea what a summoning scroll is, and you want to know the best part is? asked Kayubi. Naruto could practically feel the large smile plastered on Kayubi as he said, No, what? The best part about this is that you can't get back without a summoning scroll. Naruto's face went completely blank, as his brain possessed this new information. Then in one quick outburst Naruto shouted out loud, What the hell do you mean by I can't get back? Ignatus slightly flinched by the sudden uproar from Naruto. He shook his head slightly in hopes of removing the ringing in his ear holes. Now, now young one, what is with all this commotion? A damn fox tricked me into coming here, and apparently I have no way to get back, said Naruto with anger in his voice. I never tricked you, you came here on your own accord, said Kayubi, Naruto could feel the beast's sadistic smile in his mind. As Naruto rolled his eyes Ignatus said, well maybe I can help you out, tell me, more about this so called jutsu you mentioned and there might be something in the chronicler archives that might help, said Ignatus. Suddenly the blue crystal floating about the flames turned red, and emitted a red glow across the room. Turning his attention to the crystal, Ignatus hurried towards it. Curious Naruto followed the dragon. As Ignatus gazed into the crystal an image of a figure clouded in black fog appeared upon the crystal. I did not think they would gather their forces so quickly, said Ignatus, with worry in his voice. What do you mean? Who is that? asked Naruto. That young one would be what remains of the Dark Master's army. Since the death of their leader two months ago, they have been regrouping and causing trouble throughout our world, but all they are capable of are small skirmishes here and there, not much of a force, but they are still a threat. Naruto stayed silent, as he continued to gaze upon the image on the crystal. He then broke his silence when he asked, Is there anything I can do to help? Ignatus was shocked to say the least by this question. I'm not sure young one, can you fight? Of course I can fight. I am one of the greatest ninjas in all of the land, said Naruto, stroking his ego. If you don't mind me asking, why do you want to help us? asked Ignatus as he turned and faced the orange ninja. Well I'm stuck here for who knows how long, I might as well help out the locals, besides I can't really stand on the sidelines while innocents may die, even if they are not from my world. 
It's my duty as the future Hokage to protect everyone who needs it, said Naruto. I see, mumbled Ignatus as he had never heard such words from a youngling, aside from his former student. Well, you won't be much help alone, so you must first warn the others about the approaching dangers. If you will excuse me for just one moment, Ignatus walked towards a giant archway and left the room. A few minutes later, Ignatus returned with a large rolled up parchment that was nearly as tall as Naruto, in his claw. Ignatus then gave Naruto the parchment and said, Bring this to the guardians, and tell them what is to come. Naruto lost his balance for a second as he held the letter. Once you talk to the other guardians, there is a small favor I wish to ask of you, Ignatus stated. And that would be, what now? Naruto asked, getting a holding on to the large scroll trying not to fall over again. Two months ago, before I was given my position here, a student of mine, a young dragon named, Spyro, and companion of his, Cinder, faced off with the Dark Master and defeated him, but they have been missing ever since. The old dragon sad with sadness in his voice. Okay I don't know who the Dark Master is, but can't you just find them in that crystal that was showing those other guys before? I have tried young one believe me, but try as I might, I cannot find them with my powers, Ignatus responded. Then why not go look for yourself? I wish I could, Naruto, but I am bound to this place unable to leave and only to watch and guide. Naruto could feel the sadness in the elder creature. It felt so close to when Sasuke punched a hole right though this gut with the Chidori and abandoned him in Kohana, and unable to do much about it. Don't, worry, Ignatus Sama, I promise you I'll find your student no matter how long it takes. Ignatus could only stare at the ninja after his proclamation, finding this young being promised slightly awe-inspiring. Ignatus couldn't help but chuckle a little and said, Very well then, Naruto, and thank you, I promise by the time you get back I'll have all the information you need. Now off you go. With that said, Ignatus opened a portal next to the young ninja for him to exit, though. Wait, how will I find these guardians, and where can I start to look for your student and his companion? asked Naruto. Finding the guardians will be simple. I will send you back to Warfang, the city you were at before I took you here. From there, all you must do is find the largest building, and they will be there. As for Spyro and Cinder, the only thing I can advise is for you to seek out a tracker known as Hunter, if anyone can find them it is him. As for their last known location they vanished near the mountain of Malfour, said Ignatus. Naruto gave him an affirmative nod before, grabbing full hold on the parchment and turned toward the portal. Wait one more thing before you go, shouted Ignatus just as Naruto was about to jump through the portal. Huh? Around the teal dragon's neck the crystal began to glow brightly and a small piece was separated from the main crystal and floated over to the departing ninja Naruto opened his hand allowing the small crystal to fall into it. What's this for? Naruto asked unsure of the tiny gem. By normal means I am unable to communicate with anyone, but with this gem I will be able to stay regular commutation with you. Now please deliver the message to the guardians and Warfang and find Spyro. Naruto just smiled confidently at Ignatus. No problem, Ignatus Sama. Naruto said loudly before jumping through the portal. Sama. What in the ancestors' names could that mean? Ignatus thought, but quickly shook his head of the thought, and walked into the immense archive that was the home of the chroniclers in order to uphold his end of the deal to Naruto. And dollar carat and percent carat and asterisk dollar carat carat percent asterisk and asterisk and asterisk percent dollar hash five dollar carat percent dollar carat. On the other side of the portal, Naruto felt weightless. That is when he noticed that he was several feet off the ground. I hate portals. Naruto said before landing hard on his rear, and dropping the parchment at his side. After grumbling a few curses and rubbing his sore rear, Naruto grabbed the parchment and hopped up onto the nearest building, once more completely ignoring anyone watching him. Gazing around Naruto found the large building in the middle of the city, so were those dragons I saw before were the guardians? Naruto muttered, before proceeding to jump to building after building, heading towards the dragon temple. On the way Naruto saw a variety of other creatures besides the dragons and moles. What's with this world? Just how many different creatures exist here? Naruto thought soaring through the air to the next roof, before finally arriving at the main door to the temple, surprising the guards as he came sailing out of the sky right between them. Excuse me, but I have a message for the guardians, mind letting me though? The two guards gave the being in front of them an unknowing look. Explain the origin of your message. Creature. One of the guards spoke up. 
I have a message from the chronicler Ignatus for the guardians. As Naruto spoke both of the guards drew their swords and quickly crossed them near Naruto's neck. That's impossible Master Ignatus has been dead for two months, the guard on the left stated. You're pretty bad for an assassin. Wait I'm not an assassin, Naruto panicked, throwing his hands up in defense. Then what are you? The guard on the right asked. I'm a ninja, which is something like an assassin, but hey, Naruto shouted as he jumped backward avoiding the guards as they tried to decapitate him. I knew you were an assassin, causing Naruto to groan. All right, let's try this instead then, Naruto said, bring his fingers into a cross. Shadow clone jutsu. The ninja exclaimed. To the guard's amazement a plume of smoke blocked their visions for a moment only to clear later and reveal eight Naruto's standing in front of them. All right, see if you can catch me before, I kill the guardians, the eight Naruto's announced sarcastically at the same time before splitting into two groups of four, before dashing left and right. Up nearby on a roof, the real Naruto watched with great amusement as the two guards clambered over each chasing after his clones. Man how stupid can two people be? Naruto said snickering. I thoroughly have to agree young one that is an amusing trick, Naruto heard from something landing behind him. Spinning around Naruto found himself face to face with a large yellow dragon with a steel colored underbelly and horns. Now care to explain to me how you claim to have a message from a dead fellow guardian? The dragon asked giving Naruto a warm smile, slightly unnerving Naruto. Fifteen minutes later, so Naruto is it? A gruff voice questioned not really looking for an answer. While I have seen my fair share of strange things in the dragon realms, Dimension Hopper has to be one of the stranger ones, an old green dragon said. Come now Terador, it's not strange it's outright ridiculous, a blue dragon said rather sharply, after hearing Naruto's explanation. I would have disagree with you there Cyril, said the yellow dragon Naruto met earlier. You've seen the letter he brought us, and it does look like Indus's writing. Besides I don't see why he would try to forge a fake letter. As true as that might be I can't say myself that this whole thing doesn't sound a little absurd, said Terador. But just think about the possibilities this brings us, said Volter. To be able to communicate with others outside of the dragon realms, and all of the knowledge we could learn from one another. Please, Naruto, how many others can travel to other realms? I believed you called it a reverse summoning jutsu. Before Naruto could answer Terador said, Volter, we can discuss such matters at a later time. Right now we need to focus on preparing for the upcoming battles. I couldn't agree with you anymore, said Cyril, but before we discuss more about defensive tactics, Naruto, it said in the letter that you are off in search of, Spyro, and, Cinder. Is there anything we might be able to do to help you on your journey? Naruto pondered this for a moment before saying, a point in the right direction would be nice. Oh and any food you can spare would be nice as well, especially if you have any ramen. We are afraid that we don't know what this ramen is, but if it is supplies that you need then we can surely help you with that, said Volter. We can also have a friend of ours help you on your search. Oh yay, Ignatus, told me about a tracker of sorts. I believe his name was Hunter? said Naruto. You would be correct, said Terador. Now if you will excuse us we need to make plans for future battles. We will have some guards escort you to him. You are dismissed. Once that was said, two dragon guards covered head to toe in armor walked up behind Naruto. Just as Naruto and the two guards began to leave the room, they heard the three guardians discuss their plans. After they left the room, Naruto and the two guards began to walk down a few long hallways in total silence, which began to annoy Naruto slightly. Wanting someone to speak, Naruto asked, So who is this hunter guy? Hunter is a powerful cheetah, who from what I have seen, is a very talented tracker, said the guard on his left. But don't forget his skills with a bow, said the other guard, I've heard that he can pin a bird to a tree with an arrow from 25 meters away without killing it. He's that strong? asked Naruto. Wait a moment, you said he was a cheetah. I thought that this was the dragon realms? Shouldn't everyone be considered dragons? Of course not, said the guard on the left. Just because this is the dragon realms it don't mean that there aren't other species. Then why is it called the dragon realms then? asked Naruto. We don't know, said the guard on the right. Well actually what I should say is that we don't remember. The reason why has been lost in history a long time ago. 
We just have been calling it the Dragon Realms because that is what our fathers told us, and that is what their fathers told them, and so on so. The three of them grew quiet once more after their conversation for several more minutes. They eventually reached a door and stood in front of it. We are here, said the guard on the right, as he lifted one of his paws and knocked on the door. Come in. Was heard from the other side, of the door prompting the guard to open it to the room inside. Inside the room was a rather humble setting a small fire crackled in the corner chimney and a small cot was pushed to the wall, and covering the room was from what Naruto could tell was hunting equipment, and countless rolled up papers. Hovering over a table against the other wall was a tall cheetah tracing a single claw across a map. What is it? The cheetah asked calmly without turning his attention away from his map. The guardians have sent you someone with a favor to ask. The cheetah's ears perked up, and turned around facing Naruto and the guards. Naruto immediately found the cheetah's eyes locked solely on him, Hunter's eyes widening in surprise. A Xenosian, he spoke in a low surprised tone, Naruto barely picking up what he said. What manner of creature are you? Quickly moving away from his earlier tone. I'm a human. But my name's, Naruto, sir nice to meet you, Naruto said smiling and holding his hand outward in greeting. I'm Hunter. Likewise, Hunter said shaking Naruto's hand, assuming it was some form of greeting of the human in front of him. Letting go of Naruto's hand, Hunter asked. So what favor do you need of me? I'm here of behalf of Master Ignatus to request your help. The cheetah gave Naruto a strange look at the mention of a dead guardian's name. It even had the guards share look believing this midget next to them was insane. Leave us. Hunter said to the guards, they simply bowed and exited the room. Waiting until they were out of earshot, Hunter then questioned Naruto. So what favor do you need of me? Master Ignatus has asked me to recruit your help in finding Spyro and Cinder. Impossible. What's impossible? Oh, please don't tell me I have given someone else an hour-long explanation, on how I talked to a dead dragon like with the old guys back there, Naruto exclaimed. Hunter laughed a little at the guardians referred to as old in such a way. No, it's not that I have little doubt that dragons are capable of nearly anything, Hunter said turning back to the map on the table. I have been trying to find those two for a while now, and I have not had any luck whatsoever, I feel so close to giving up. But, Ignatus, still believes they're alive, Naruto said, worried that he would be unable to get Hunter's help. That count for something right. Hunter granted Naruto a small gaze and then went right back to his map. Perhaps, it does. Hunter said, thinking about it then smiling the cheetah answered. Well I suppose I can't give up if Ignatus hasn't. A new hope lit up in Naruto's eyes at his answer. Now here where we get started. Carrot percent dollar asterisk carrot percent and dollar percent carrot seven percent carrot and asterisk dollar percent and carrot eight and carrot carrot eight hundred fifty four million five hundred sixty four thousand six hundred forty five. In Konoha. A blonde woman moaned letting her head slam right into her wooden desk, in front of her sat stacks upon stacks of paperwork, sunlight showed through the windows of the Hokage's office showing her that Don had broken on yet another night of nothing but paperwork. Sitting up Tsunade pinched the bridge of her nose. Why on earth did I let that brat talk me into taking this job? Trying to let go of her stress of the evil paperwork she turned her chair around and casted her gaze over Konoha. The light of the early hours bathed the peaceful village in a dim peaceful glow. She gave a small smile as she looked out upon the village, well it's not all that bad, she sighed. At least now I understand what Dan and Nawaki wanted, I can thank the brat for that much. As the fifth Hokage sat gazing over the village one of the window of her office opened, gaining her attention she turned to find a very distraught and worried Jiraiya. What happened Jiraiya? She asked with haste noticing his demeanor, and then she noticed something was missing. Where's Naruto? He's gone missing Tsunade. Jiraiya informed her with a grief-stricken look on his face. Asterisk. Percent carrot and asterisk and carrot. Percent carrot and carrot percent asterisk and asterisk and carrot 785,686,876. In a megacure. So. You have lost the Kyubi Jinchuriki? A tall man asked wearing a black coat with red clouds on it, with his face covered in black metal piercings and staring at the spy master in front of him with strange silver eyes. In front of him stood a being wearing similar apparel, expect his head was nearly encased in a giant Venus flytrap and his skin was split right down the middle one half black, the other white. Yes, the boy seemed to have attempted summoning without a scroll, 
so there is no way I could have tracked him at the time, as such a move could have sent him anywhere in space time. He responded to his lord. That threatens to set back our plans a great deal. The man stepped past his spy master and looked out the window overview of the village of Rain. For a time he silently looked outward over the village. Zetsu, he said. Yes. Zetsu replied answering his lord. I want you to drop all of your duties right now, to solely focus on finding the Kyubi vessel. This greatly surprised the plant-human hybrid, although he never showed such emotion. But want of the other Jinchuriki? Zetsu questioned, in a slightly surprised voice. Am I to simply stop gathering info on them? No, I will delegate others to that task. The man answered. But without capturing the Kyubi, our efforts will be in vain. Of course Lord Payne. Zetsu answered before sinking into the floor of the room. Payne continued to look over the rain village. I will spread pain across this world even if the Kyubi stays out of my grasp, he thought. The city of Crestfall, an ancient city settled in the oldest tropical jungle in the realms, built upon the underside of a cliff suspended high from the sea below. This city was the pinnacle of the dragon's might and ingenuity, it housed the most powerful dragons, artifacts and magic of its day. Of course that is the reason Malefort took it early into his campaign. Now the hanging city was nothing more than a pilfered cesspool of evil and a haven for the remains of Malefor's armies, no longer the seat of power it once was. How goes the search for the interlopers, lieutenant? A grizzled old panther conversed with an armored wolf in front of him. The wolf in front of him was covered from snout to paw in thin iron armor covering every inch of his being, not even his eyes were visible as they hid behind ice blue lenses. Not well General Pardis. He answered his voice resonating behind the iron mask. Despite the best efforts we can muster with our limited resources, we have been unable to locate the traitor and purple dragon responsible for our masters. Sudden demise. He finished choosing his wording carefully with the zealous general of Malefor speaking to him. Hum, tell me Glavard even though our master is gone, where do your loyalties lie now? Pardis asked scratching at his chin, his eyes locked on the unnerved wolf. I'm afraid I don't understand general. Glavarg asked unsure of the question of his loyalty. In these past few years we have not only lost two generals a majority of our forces, but we have lost our master as well. Pardis continued. What I mean by the rabble Glavarg is we need a new general and you fit that position perfectly. Why would you honor me with such a position? Glavarg asked. Because my forces are scattered, I cannot monitor both the management of our armies and the search for the purple one and the traitor so I am handing you access to all of our resources and a new rank to manage this mission yourself." Pardis said stating his full reasoning for Glavard promotion. I am honored General Pardis. Glavard bowed. But may I inquire one thing? Speak. Why is it so important to find the traitor and her companion? All of the searches have come up fruitless and even the dragon guardians in Warfang believe them dead. Pardis clacked a little insanity leaking through. Even though Cinder has turned traitor she can still be, reasoned, with. Why would we want either of those vile creatures on our side? Pardis's eyes immediately turned into slits, quickly drawing one of the obsidian daggers from his belt he threw it straight at Glavard's right front leg. The dagger easily pierced Glavard's iron armor tearing right into his leg causing the wolf to yelp in pain and fall back. Listen here Glavard, this will be your only warning following death, never talk down about the master's race. Pardis walked over to Glavarg and grabbed the dagger and began slowly twisting it deeper into the wolf's leg making Glavarg kneel over in pain. Though this purple dragon may be our enemy, but his very existence demands any respect you have. Understand? Pardis asked ripping out the dagger letting the blood flow freely form Glavarg's leg. Of course General Pardis. The wolf said weakly. Now get out of my sight. Pardis grinned at the fear and panic that he could see in the eyes of his new general as he quickly hobbled away clearly leaving a trail of blood as he did. Asterisk and carrot. And carrot percent carrot dollar i.e. hash and carrot percent asterisk percent carrot and, far south of Warfang. How much farther do we have to go? Naruto whined, trekking alongside Hunter in the desert. He he he, it's not much further I assure you of that Naruto. Hunter didn't find Naruto's whining annoying yet he found it rather amusing compared to others as it had a very strong underling enthusiasm that Hunter rarely ever saw in someone so young. So what are Cinder and Spyro like? Naruto asked trying to pass the time. Master Ignatus didn't speak of them. Hunter asked surprised by Naruto's question, 
to which Naruto only shook his head. Hmm that is surprising, Spyro and Ignatus had a strong father-son relationship, he I wouldn't be surprised if they were for real. Hunter said slight laughing to himself about the two. So what do you want to know? Well I kind of wish I did know what I wanted to know. I barely know anything about dragons or their abilities I still just got here. Naruto said sheepishly. Haha. You're not too bright are you? Hunter asked Naruto, causing the ninja to only grin. Yeah I tend to get that a lot. At least you're eager to learn, do you at least know of the four races of dragons and their powers? Naruto shook his head once more. Well we do have some time before we reach our destination so I will begin, Hunter said. You see Naruto the dragons are separated into four different classes by the element they wield, earth, fire, ice, and electricity, and each one respectively restricted to their one element. Of course each one concentrate on a certain trait, from what I have witnessed by the guardians alone. Master Terador uses his earth element in close range combat battering though his foes without mercy. Master Cyril has mostly used his ice in long ranged combat with high precision. Master Volter uses his electricity element to paralyze and heal foes and allies alike. Master Ignatus used his powers in much the same way Terador Dos expect fire lacks the defensive skills that earth commands, however it has a more destructive power if used correctly. That's awesome and all but which of those are Spyro and Cinder? Naruto asked trying to get the info from Hunter. Hmm. Hunter smiled. Spyro is all and Cinder is none. Huh? Naruto had a severely confused look on his face. What the hell is that supposed to mean? You see Naruto, Spyro is a purple dragon which means he holds the ability to wield all four elements of all the other dragons along with being able to control time itself s, as well as a whole myriad of other powers that are unknown to me. Really someone who can control all four dragon elements, that's awesome. Naruto yelled imagining what an awesome dragon like Spyro would look like, but he stopped his daydreaming when a thought came to mind, so what's he like? Spyro, him he is a very heroic dragon from what I've seen and heard, willing to put his own life on the line for others no matter the cost. So a hero, huh? Naruto said, gazing up at the clear blue desert sky thinking. He kind of sounds like the Hokage of my village. I am sorry but what is a Hokage Naruto? Hunter inquired. Well the Hokage is the leader of my village, usually he will be the strongest ninja among us and the most respected. My personal hero is the fourth Hokage who gave up his life to protect the entire village from a giant demon by sealing it away. Pray tell what kind of beast needs to be sealed, why not kill it, even then what could hold such a beast? And that's when Naruto bit his tongue. Ah it's a demon. A spirit they can't be killed, and heck if I know what the thing was sealed in. Naruto said not wanting to mention that Kayubi was sealed in his gut to a stranger. Wanting to change the subject Naruto asked, So what about Cinder then? You said she was none, so she does have any element? Cinder, is a rather complicated case, in the terms of a dragon, Hunter said forgetting his last question. How? Well you see when she was very young the dark master used his dark magic and infused it inside of her, giving her the power over what the dragons call the dark elements those being wing, poison, shadow, and fear. However alongside these new powers, she became his puppet, and did what he told her to do. Because of this hundreds of cheetahs, moles, and even dragons were killed by her. This news came as a shock to Naruto. But wait, I was told that she helped defeat the dark master? She did. You see Spyro fought Cinder while she was under the Dark Master's control, and in the end freed her from his control, said Hunter. Naruto stayed quiet as he thought about this new information. In a way it reminded him of Sasuke and Orochimaru. Sasuke was his friend, but then Orochimaru did something to Sasuke to make him want to leave the Leaf Village and betray him. Then another thought crossed Naruto's mind. You guys keep on talking about the Dark Master, and all of the evil that he has done, but who is he? His real name is Malefor, and he was a purple dragon, like Spyro. From what I was told he was a prodigy, and powerful even for a dragon, until a lust for power grew too strong, corrupting his mind. When his power became too great to tame and his lust for power grew out of control, the dragon elders of his time banished him. From this he grew hatred for his race and from this newfound hatred, he grew an army to destroy the entire dragon race. After a massive battle of which he lost, he was sealed away in his own fortress never to be heard from again until a few years ago.
We're lucky Spyro and Cinder defeated him, or else we would all be dead right now. Silence fell upon the two of them once more. They continued to walk through the desert in silence, until a village came into view as they reached the top of a hill. Is that where we can Spyro and Cinder? asked Naruto, tired of all their walking. Well not quiet, said Hunter. Well what the hell are we doing here then? asked Naruto annoyed. We are here because I know of someone who might know the whereabouts of their location. The two soon reached the village, and walked around until they came across a tavern. Upon entering several eyes turned towards Naruto and Hunter. Inside Naruto saw several dragons, moles, and cheetahs sitting in the booths. There were also some creatures that Naruto did not know. They reminded him of wolves. Only these wolf-like creatures stood on two legs. Naruto could hear the occupants whisper amongst themselves as himself and Hunter walked towards the cheetah behind the counter. Ah oh, it's good to see you again Hunter, said the cheetah behind the counter once Hunter and Naruto reached it. Who's the kid? Hello Adolf, this is Naruto. Naruto, Adolf, said Hunter as he gestured to one other. Nice to meet you kid, said Adolf as he extended his paw. Uh, likewise, said Naruto, as he shook his paw. Now then, said Adolf turning his attention to Hunter, what brings you all the way out here? Naruto here has convinced me to search for Spyro and Cinder once more. Has any word of them popped up anywhere? I'm afraid I can't help you there, Hunter. I haven't heard anything about them. Nothing of use to you anyway. Are you sure they're even alive? asked Adolf. Of course they're alive, said Naruto. The chronicler told me so. Adolf couldn't help but chuckle at Naruto's remark. Sure he did kid. He also told me that it's going to rain tomorrow, so you may want to stay indoors. Hunter noticed rage swelling inside Naruto, so before something happened he said, Well thank you for your help Adolf. I apologies for the trouble. Hey no need to apologies, your little friend over here has been plenty of enjoyment, said Adolf, as he watched Naruto and Hunter leave. Outside the tavern, Naruto said, well he was no help, now what do we do? Letting out a sigh, Hunter said, well I guess we just have to go out there and search for. Excuse me my kind sure, interrupted one of the wolf-like creatures Naruto saw as it walked out of the tavern. I couldn't help but overhear that you're looking for Spyro and Cinder. Do you know where they are? asked Hunter with excitement. I might, but I might need something to jog my memories, said the wolf as he reached out one of his paws. Rolling his eyes Hunter reached into his pouch and pulled out several small red, green, and some purple crystals and put them into the wolf's paw. The wolf counted the crystals and shook his head, it's on the tip of my tongue, but I still can't remember. Getting angry at the wolf. Hunter reached into his pouch once more and pulled out more of the crystals and gave them to the wolf. Counting them the wolf shook his head again. Come on now, this is Spyro and Cinder we're talking about, surely they're worth a little more than this. Clenching his fist, trying to remove the urge to clobber the thieving wolf, Hunter turned to Naruto. That was all I had, do you have anything? Naruto reached into his pocket and pulled out a frog looking bag and looked inside and saw that it was empty except for two gold coins. Dumping them out, Naruto handed them to the wolf. Confused by the foreign objects the wolf took them and inspected them. After biting them the wolf said, Yay that's real gold alright. I'm sure the local blacksmith would pay nicely for these. The wolf then pocketed all of his newly earned money and then gestured to Hunter and Naruto to follow him. The wolf ended up leading them to the outskirts of town where something of a market was set up. Expect they weren't selling items or food. Different creatures of varying ages and races sat within steel cages. What is this place? Naruto said, seeing quite a few different races caged. Why are we in a slave market? I thought these were completely outlawed by the dragon sovereigns, Hunter stated, hating the very thought of such a place. You're really not up to date with information are you? The wolf said with a cocky grin. These lands don't belong to the sovereigns anymore, and that means in my trade you're fair game. Motioning his claw several other beings surrounded Naruto. Hunter of the Avalar Cheetah tribe, you'll fetch a very fine price. And your little friend I've never seen something like him before I bet I could get a fortune for him. Oh no way in hell you're selling us as salves. Naruto said quickly catching on to the wolf, and ready himself for a fight pulling out a kunai. Yes I have to agree Naruto. I refuse to become a piece of merchandise. Hunter quickly drew his bow and immediately shot two wolves clear in their head, 
before anyone could notice how fast this was done both wolves fell dead. Naruto was next to act, quickly driving his kunai deep into a belly of a wolf near him and delivered a jaw-crushing kick to another. The rest of the wolf's henchmen could only gawk at what they saw, in a mere matter of a few seconds four of their comrades were disposed of with great ease. Well anyone else, Naruto yelled, making the remaining wolves flinch and back off slowly before vanishing into the slave market. Well damn, that was rather boring, the wolf said casually, scratching his neck before cracking his knuckles. I don't what you were hoping to accomplish there, but you better release what you know about Spyro and Cinder now. Hunter demanded, drawing his bow back and aiming at the wolf. Fine fine, I'll talk, the wolf said calmly holding his claws above his head in defeat. I know when I'm beat. Hunter quickly took this opportunity to bind the wolf's hands and feet before he could try anything else. As Hunter did this Naruto made his way over to the wolf and knelt down beside him, so what were you hoping to accomplish by this? The wolf cracked a grin, it's the only life I know and I rather enjoy it. You're sick, Naruto said, gaining a hollow laugh from the wolf. Enough talk. Where are the dragons? Hunter demanded, aiming an arrow at his head. About a month ago, a slaver from the northern badlands came down here, with a great prize as he called it. It was a large white crystal with two dragons frozen inside it. To me and many of the other salvers thought he was mad, he was going on and on the entire night he was here about how he had a very right buyer in driftwood and was going to strike it rich, the wolf told them. Honestly what anyone would want with a few dead dragons is beyond me, a dead slave is a worthless salve no matter what way you cut it. Thank you for your cooperation, Hunter said, quivering his arrow and putting away his bow. Let's go Naruto, Hunter said walking away. Wait, what is it Naruto, Hunter asked, what about the slaves here, Naruto said angrily, noticing that Hunter didn't seem to care at his question. Hunter sighed, I am sorry Naruto but there is nothing we can do here, we don't need to draw unwanted attention more so than we already have, he tried to explain. Naruto was about to retort when the Kyubi spoke to him. Kit, heed his explanation, I feel forces far darker than my own, I think it would be bad for your well-being. Since when do you care so much? Naruto threw back at the Kitsune. I care when there are high chances of me dying in the process. The Kyubi roared at Naruto. Now if you unseal me and want to do it on your own, Naruto mentally cut the Kyubi off and found Hunter staring at the silent ninja. All right let's go then, Hunter raised an eyebrow at the ninja. What a strange cohort you have here Ignatus. Hunter finished his thoughts and nodded to Naruto and began walking away with Naruto following close behind. Back in town, as Naruto and Hunter quietly walked through the town, Naruto held a rather angry demeanor at the cat, something Hunter took notice of. I am sorry Naruto, but the chance of drawing Blavard's attention is too high here. So, Naruto retorted, what's so special about him? A wolf with the ability to snap freeze his enemies at a moment's notice, then taking great joy in crushing them with his claws, not to mention he is a high-ranking officer in the Dark Army. You mean Malefor's army? Naruto gulped mentally forgetting any anger he had, realizing what Hunter was trying to do. Hunter only nodded. His forces run rampant here, and I can go without gaining a visit from him or one of his men, he explained. Sorry then so, at least we know where they are right. I certainly hope so, and if so we should go to Driftwood right now, Hunter said. So another long walk across the desert. Naruto dreaded the very thought of it. No that would waste too much time, so we need to see Adolf again. E.H. What for? The cheetah smiled. You'll see. He said before bouncing off toward the tavern. Hey wait up, Naruto ran after him, back on the outskirts of town. Damn that brat, the wolf complained as he pulled fragment of steel off his body. If I ever see the, mid-sentence he literally stopped cold his entire body frozen expect for part of his head. Char, a hollow voice echo inside of a steel helmet. It was then his entire being truly froze with fear. A Lieutenant Glavarg, how nice to see you. Char said, unable to face the wolf general. The fully armored wolf lumbered into the tent and faced Char with the cold blue lenses that acted as his eyes. That's general to you. Oh my, someone's been working hard, so what do I owe this ice-cold visit for? One of my informants overhead you divulging information, 
about a certain pair of dragons to a cheetah, and now you're going to tell me about it. Glavard laid his claw on Char's shoulder and began to crack his frozen body. I don't feel so good, Naruto muttered, with his hand over his mouth and leaning over the railing. Was this really the only way to get there? He complained to Hunter. The cheetah laughed at Naruto. I'd take you have never traveled by air before then. Naruto gave Hunter something equivalent of a death glare, before outright vomiting. Unless you want to jump off the ship right now we can start walking across the desert to Driftwood. Hunter stated with a hidden smirk. Naruto, while he didn't like this airship thing, he didn't relish the idea of walking days across the shifting sands ever again. No, I'm, gulp, good. Naruto said, still hanging over the railing. Well good then, try to get some sleep while you can Naruto, Hunter said smirking at Naruto before walking away. After this I am gulp never f flying gulp again. Naruto tried to exclaim, right before throwing up over the side of the airship once more. Fucking airship. Hey you damn kid, what the hell are you doing puking all over my ship? The captain yelled. This is going to be a vv very l long ride. Naruto muttered, before feeling the need to puke again, but this time missed the railing and hit the deck with it. Oh, come on. The captain yelled in distress. It was indeed going to be a very long ride. Town of Driftwood an hour later. The manor of Zekeler family was brimming into the hours of twilight. Several of Driftwood's noble families had come to attendance, the Galanese Dragon Clan, the Triad of Hidden Shadows, a family of thieves and lastly the Alabaster Brick family. It also had abundance from the cities, rich individuals, as well. Why do you think Lord Zekeler has called us all here? A ice dragon of the Galanese dragon clan asked. Bah I doubt it's of any real importance. A mole spat. Any time that whack ass ever call us to one of these parties is to show off a cockamamie plan, or some random magic trinket, that isn't magic or doesn't work, quite honestly the only reason I come is to watch him make a fool of himself. I hear that, called a fire dragon. Do you remember the mind control callers? and the energy transfer orbs, or even the staff that he could use to control another creature and use its power as his own. Yeah, I still remember how hard I laughed at the hours he spent just yelling, magic, words into the air his face just got so red, I just hope I get a good laugh in this time, the ice dragon said back. Hey quiet down Lord Zekeler is here, a nearby attendee hushed them. Then with the attention of most of the room on him a small mole wearing a very expensive robe and wearing a Chinese emperor's hat, and wearing glasses across his beady little eyes, walked in, holding the same gold staff with a golden cobra head on the top, that many there had seen before. Families of Driftwood, the mole called out, for too long the sovereign kings have ruled over us, and I am finally ready to overthrow them. Many beings in the crowd just rolled their eyes at his statement. For I have finally obtained the final piece of the puzzle, bring it out you two brutes. Behind him two gorillas slowly rolled out a large chuck of jet black obsidian with two very faint dragon silhouettes showing within the crystal. This my friends is going to give me my well dissevered power. The mole held the gold staff to the skies and began chanting in nearly in a harsh raspy tone that none could understand. The ground began to shake violently the rock walls of the Zekeler manor began to sway and crack the sky turned dark, and the staff began to crackle violently with green energy. It collected in the staff before shooting right into the obsidian before Lord Zekeler, when it made contact the glass blew apart in an instant, giving no one time to avoid its broken shards, and inhaling the dust that went with it. As the dust settled there stood two dragons with glowing green eyes and a black mist rolling off their bodies, obstructing their scale color from view. But it was visible that they were two young dragons in their late teens. At this sight Lord Zekeler couldn't help but grin that something he was doing was finally working. Then he felt a strange tingling in his hand, lifting up his left hand to his face he found his hand crackling with electricity, the more he concentrated on it the more it grew in power and crackling wicked grin began to cross his face as he slowly turned back to he raised his hand that was surging with energy upon the crowd, and let the full extent of his power be known to Driftwood. All that could be heard on this lone night in Driftwood was the laughing of a madman and the surge of lighting he welled upon the residents of Driftwood. Off in the distance from Zekeler Manor, a silver eagle watched intently as fire rose from the town and lighting burst into the sky, before quickly flying off to the south. While lowly muttering, the king will need to hear about this. 
the driftwood air harbor the next morning, and stay off, the captain yelled, while literally tossing Naruto off his ship which the shinobi quite sick from his ride was unable to compose himself and hit the wooden dock face first. Finally glad that the air sick ninja was gone, he found it quite satisfying to throw this customer off, he grinned to himself and turned back to the ship to finish cleaning off the mess Naruto had made. Hunter who was now exiting the ship just took his passing look at the captain and sighed, he couldn't really blame the ship captain for his actions, but at this same time he also wanted to slug the overzealous boatman. Completely exiting the ship Hunter knelt down next to Naruto. Are you alright Naruto? Hunter questioned the face down shinobi. Naruto gave the cheetah wobbly thumbs up with his right hand and pushed himself up with his left hand. For the most gulp part 1 am, fine, just, a little sick right now, he said trying to bring himself up off the ground. And hungry as well, he stated once he got up. The statement itself nearly made the cheetah fall over, not in his most sane state could he comprehend how someone who had been throwing up the entire night and the second it stops, begin thinking about eating all at the same time. Fine then Naruto, there's a tavern nearby so let's see if we can find something to eat then. As soon as Hunter finished his sentence, he noticed that Naruto was already far ahead of him, Hunter could only give the moment a questioning look, wondering just what Naruto was really capable of and just what kind of world did he come from. Pushing these thoughts aside, Hunter quickly ran after the orange ninja. Not long after catching up to him, which to Hunter's surprise was a little difficult as Naruto jumped up to the roofs he showed him the way to the tavern with a sign that read the sleeping dragon. Inside, much like the last tavern Naruto entered, it was filled a countless number of dragons, moles, and cheetahs. Thought there were no wolves, in there. Not that Naruto mind that, after their last encounter with a wolf, he didn't really want to meet more. The first thing Naruto did, once he was inside was run to the counter and scoured the menu looking for some delectable food, as Hunter soon followed. Well hello sir and um, kid, said the mole behind the counter, not sure what Naruto was. Why do so many people call me a kid? Thought Naruto slightly annoyed to be given that name once more. Just some water will be fine with me, said Hunter not all that hungry as he had eaten on the airship. I would love to have some ramen, said Naruto, determined to find some ramen in the dragon realms. Look kid, I don't have a clue, what this, ramen? so if you're just going to list off items that don't exist, then please leave, said the mole behind the counter. Hey, first of all ramen is a real, and secondly, Naruto was about to continue his rant when Hunter placed a paw on his shoulder and shook his head, telling the ninja to drop it Naruto did as asked and turned back to the mole said, just give me whatever. All right then, one water and one whatever, coming right up, said the mole before walking into the back room. Hunter glanced over to Naruto, who was clearly still angry for the lack of ramen in the tavern. So is ramen really that delicious? Asked Hunter. You seem to be quite fond of it. Are you kidding? It one of the best tasting noodles in all of the land, said Naruto, slightly drooling, as he imagined the taste of each single noodle as he ate a mouthful of it. Well then if they are as tasty as you claim them to be then I will be sure to provide you some if we are successful with our mission, promised Hunter. Soon after the mole came back with one cup of water, and a sheep's leg, and gave them to Hunter and Naruto. Is there anything else I can help you guys with? The mole asked. Yes one more thing, said Hunter. Has anyone seen a large crystal containing two dragons inside, somewhere around town? The mole stared at Hunter with a confused look. You boys sure strange I will give you that. No I haven't heard anything like that at all. Hunter sighed. The thought of finding Spyro and Cinder seemed to be slipping from his grasp. All right then, thank you, come Naruto, said Hunter as he started to leave. Naruto hearing his name being called looked up at the feline with a mouthful of food. He handed the mole the plate his food came with and took the sheep's leg with him. Hunter however didn't make it far when the mole behind the counter said, however, if you are looking for something as strange as that, I've heard that Lord Zekeler has been known to have in his possession strange items. Why don't you try looking there? A smile crept onto Hunter's face as he gained some hope. Thank you my kind sir. Come Naruto, we're off to see Lord Zekeler. That would be a poor choice, my friends. A nearby cheetah said, this gained Hunter's attention causing him to face the fellow member of his race. And why would you say that? Naruto chimed in. 
Just a warning is all, just a warning, the cheetah said slowly before returning his attention back to his drink. Weirdo, Naruto muttered before turning to leave the tavern followed shortly by Hunter. Outside the tavern, so any ideas on where to look for this, Lord Zekeler first. Naruto asked looking at Hunter hoping the cheetah had some idea, but Hunter only shrugged. I can only suggest we just ask around town until we get an answer from someone, on Lord Zekeler whereabout, Hunter suggested, causing Naruto to mutter obviously annoyed by his answer. Right back to step one it is then huh? Kayubi taunted Naruto. Stow it fuzzball. Naruto shot back, getting a dark chuckle from the Kayubi. So where should we start then? Hunter gazed around the seaside town for only a movement before answer Naruto's question. The local market is as good as anywhere I guess, not much else for us to go on. Hunter began his way over toward the town market. Hopefully it's not another slave market. Naruto said hoping there wasn't one here like the last town. Hunter smiled at the young shinobi beside him. Don't worry Naruto here slavery is highly illegal. But why is it so different here then? Naruto asked. From the last place we were in. Because this small seaside city here belongs to a nation across the sea called Esriseeth, Hunter said to Naruto as they entered the market area. And the laws from Esriseeth on slavery are so severe that even ownership of a slave usually means death. Sounds a little harsh, but I guess everyone has their ways. Naruto thought aloud, before he was quickly ripped away from his thoughts as he saw the most bizarre sight he had seen since he arrived at this world. Hunter what is that? Naruto slightly exclaimed to Hunter. Hunter gave Naruto a small gaze before looking to where the ninja was pointing his mouth went completely agape over at a nearby market stall, was a shorter than an average mole, holding a golden staff in his hands and two jet black young dragons with him, who he immediately recognized and knew something was very wrong with the two. Naruto follow me, Hunter quickly said before making his way onto a nearby roof with Naruto close behind, trying to attain an overlook of the two dragons. Wait what's going on Hunter? Naruto exclaimed not knowing what was distressing the cheetah, but his words went completely unheard by Hunter. Whose eyes were narrowed and centered on the two dragons below them. As Hunter observed them they began to walk off. It's them Naruto, Spyro and Cinder. Hunter said in a low voice. Really? Naruto said getting a better look at the two walking away. I thought you said Spyro was a purple dragon. Naruto stated. No that's Spyro all right and Cinder as well I think they're begin corrupted, and I think I know who's doing it. Hunter said referring to the mole in between the two. Who is it then? Naruto asked turning to Hunter, who had drawn his bow and already had an arrow pulled back. Whoa man what the hell? Naruto yelled at the top of his lungs. Drawing the attention of everyone below them including the mole Hunter was targeting. The little mole gazed up at the rooftop they were both on right as Hunter released his arrow right at him. The mole's eye widened in fear as the arrow quickly neared his being. Elsewhere, a white dragon narrowed his eyes and barred his teeth letting a low growl seep out. Angst and anger were building up within his being, his claws dug into the stone floor under him it began to crack under his force. He could believe out of all the asinine things he had heard in his life this had to be the foulest. The royal guards in the room on both sides began to quiver in fear at the very presence of the current ice dragon king of Esrisi. How dare you even bring such a proposal to me Rak? Ryujin roared at the crown prince of Urkantro. Rak was a fire dragon of 16 years of age, his scales were a dark red, his underbelly was a dull gold, and three black horns sat on his head and on the tip of his tail was a jagged spear point. Well what do you propose we do then? Rak shot back at the king of Esrisi. The five kingdoms lay in disarray all have no acting rulers, expect for you your highness. And the throne in Crestfall sits empty with no heir, and the dragon council and the emperor sit closed off in their little island nation, unwilling to lend a hand to any of us. He finished with a snarl. Ryujin let out a loud growl this time nearly making the prince flinch, the floor finally shattered under his very grip. I am not going to allow the annexation of Crestfall, by my nation or yours or anyone else's he said pointing his tail at Rack, and I will not allow you to usurp the system that has kept the realms in peace for the last 500,000 years. One thing that Ryujin held close to himself was tradition, the old ways, and the history of the realms. Where's that peace now? Rack exclaimed flaring some smoke from his maw. Mailfors, 
followers have killed our parents and now hold the city of Crestfall hostage. It's time for something new, it's time for change to beat back his following forever. And what about what will happen during the change you want rack? Ryujin retorted back at him. It's painfully obvious anarchy will sweep the lands, during you proposed plan, I see nothing but collapse, death, and war for hundreds of years to come. Ryujin's anger at the prince was starting to show as the floor around him began to freeze by him just being there. Now Ju, Ryujin was cut off, as a silver eagle, came flying into the room. King Ryujin, it called to the ice dragon in the room, I have some very pressing news. Ryujin sighed and asked, can it wait, I am in the middle of an important matter here. I'm afraid not sire, it is rather urgent. Ryujin sighed once more and gripped his head with one of his claws as he felt the beginning signs of a bad headache begin to build. All right then, Rack we will continue this late. No, there is no later Ryujin. This has to be done whether you agree or not. Rack stated to Ryujin, the old age passed when Malefor fell, it's time to move on from the old ways. I will take my leave now Ryujin. The fire dragon finished, he turned and left with his royal guard following. I really hope this news is as urgent as you say it is I am trying to avoid a war here Silverwind. Ryujin told the eagle. I'm afraid that it is, sire. A mole by the name of Lord Zekeler has been spotted with two young dragons traveling with him, said Silverwind. We also have no doubt that he has placed them under a spell, and is now using them as his own personal slaves. Ryujin let out a stressful sigh, almost as if someone opened a floodgate inside his head, a tidal wave of pain came pouring in as his headache began. This day just gets better and better doesn't it, Ryujin mumbled to himself. He let out one more sigh before saying, are you sure, they are his slave. We are nearly 100% positive of it sire. The odds of it begin anything else are slim to none, said Silverwind. Ryujin pondered this over for a moment, before saying, continue to keep an eye on Lord Zekler. Don't do anything until you are completely positive that he is harvesting slaves, and then report back to me. Understood. Yes my liege, said Silverwind with a bow. He then turned around and flew away. Now Ryujin sat alone in his empty throne room. He didn't mind it however as he had a feeling that today was going to be a long day. Back in Driftwood, Zekler closed his eyes fearing that his life was just about to end, when suddenly he heard the arrow, bounce of stone. Opening his eyes slowly, he saw that Spyro had created a small wall of stone to protect him from the projectile. He suddenly felt immense joy as he could feel the power he now had control over. Hunter grunted, annoyed that not only was their covers blown, but also his arrow was blocked. Naruto I need you to keep them distracted, while I try to get another clear shot, alright. Naruto nodded, and pulled out a kunai from his back pocket, and charged forwards. As he did he shouted, Shadow clone just you. As the smoke cleared, Zekler saw two of the orange ninja ran towards him. He glanced at the two dragons at his side. They remained still and stared at Naruto. Well don't just stand there, go get him. Zekler shouted. Spyro and Cinder obeyed their master. Cinder flew up, while Spyro continued to charge forwards. As the two group continued their charge, Spyro engulfed himself in flames as he used a comet dash. Just before Spyro hit Naruto, Naruto jumped over Spyro, grabbing his horn in the process. With his forward motion, Spyro's head was pulled backwards, and he was flipped around onto his back. While this was going on, Cinder was releasing a torment of green blobs at him, which he dodged, before Cinder doved down towards him. Just as Cinder swept past him, she released black fire at the ninja. Once again avoiding the attack, Naruto then grabbed the dragoness as she pasted overhead. Hunter wasn't having much luck as he tried to get a clear shot at Zekler who was hiding behind the earth wall Spyro created. He tried to move to another vantage point, but Zekler would either move so he was out of sight, or Naruto, Spyro, or Cinder got in his way. Giving up with trying shooting him from a distance, Hunter put away his bow, and pulled out a knife and ran at Zekler. Back with Cinder, she had troubles flying with the extra weight on her. Naruto was flailing around, trying to get Cinder back on the ground. Growing annoyed of the ninja that held her, she looked down at him, and let loose an unbearable scream. Naruto grunted, as he felt his eardrums rattle. 
Suddenly the world around him went black. The next thing he saw was that he was back in the hidden leaf village as it was completely destroyed. As his worst fear continued to play before him in reality, Naruto had let go of Cinder and began to fall. By the time he snapped out of his trance it was too late, and he hit the ground. Instead of the splat that Cinder had expected, Naruto vanished into smoke. Growling, Cinder quickly dove back towards the ground. Just as she was about to hit the ground herself, she used her shadow abilities and dove inside the ground. The other Naruto wasn't having much luck with his battle. Whenever Naruto would try to advance closer to Zekel or Spyro would get in his way or create some sort of obstacle to stop him. Just as Naruto made his way towards Zekeler once again, Spyro fired several ice shards at his feet, freezing them in place. Naruto was just about to try to get his legs unstuck, Cinder jumped out of the ground, and tackled Naruto, sinking her teeth into his shoulder while doing so. Just before Naruto could shack her off of him, Cinder sprayed green goo all over his shoulder. Naruto grunted in pain as he felt the poison enter his blood steam. Soon he was able to throw Cinder off of him, but instead of running at Zekeler again, he just stood there, his body shaking. Naruto tried to get his body to move, but he felt the poison began to shut down his body. Naruto wasn't the only one affected by this, as Naruto hear Kayubi grunting in pain. Damn it Fox, can't you do something about this? Naruto asked in his head. No I can't this is magic, and I can't help you when it comes to that. Suddenly Naruto felt this strange new force flowing inside of him. It felt odd, but at the same time familiar. This feeling didn't last very long was, Spyro come charging towards him, with another comet dash. Naruto felt even more pain as, he was thrown across the area from Spyro's attack. Seeing this happen, Hunter changed his course of direction towards Naruto. By now he poison in Naruto's body had taken full effect, and he wasn't able to move. Seeing this hunter grabbed the fallen ninja and ran off. Zekeler watched as his enemies ran off, with a large smile on his face. Existed by his victory, he let out a small laugh, which grew louder and louder with each passing moment. Both Spyro and Cinder just watched as they got away. They were ordered to stay close to Zekeler at all times, and like the slaves that they were obeyed his command. With this power no one can stop me, although I have to be careful as well, Zekeler thought. Walls crumbled and broke down around Naruto as he slowly stood up, his mind a blur. Upon standing up he gazed around and realized where he was. Wait why am I here? Naruto said in a panic, I was just fighting those two dragons then one bit me. Remembering what occurred on the outside, Naruto then felt a sharp pain in his inner arm. Turning his gaze toward his arm he found the sleeve of his shirt torn and several tears in his flesh covered by a burning green substance. What is this? Naruto panicked as he tried to remove the substance only to burn his hand. It's what's killing us kid, the Kyubi voice muttered lowly. Well as low a bellowing demon's voice could. Still panicking Naruto quickly faced the Kyubi who was now in a horrifying state. The once great menacing beast Naruto had seen in here once before, was now a decaying corpse of that beast. The same green stuff that Naruto had on his arm was practically covering the Kyubi eating away at its flesh and chakra leave nothing but bare bones behind it. Kayubi quickly stood up, and as he did small chucks of his fur fell off. Not only that but giving me control over you. A harsher more demonic and distorted voice spoke from the decaying beast's mouth. He then rammed itself against the steel bars of its cage, causing Naruto to violently fall back from fright at the Kayubi's sudden violent temperament. Now boy you are going to release me from this prison. The distorted voice demanded of Naruto while it grinned a bony grin. Elsewhere in the Dragon Realms, Silverwind had her eyes locked on the situation that had unraveled during her spying on Lord Zekeler of Driftwood. A strange blonde male and a cheetah judging by the garb her, was of the Avalar Valley. The two had engaged in a fight with Zekeler Lackey's two black dragons, the fight itself didn't last long as the blonde male was quickly put down by the dragoness and the cheetah who was about to make a move on Zekeler abandoned his attack, gathered his ally, and quickly retreated. There were a few things Silverwind noted that were strange about what she saw, the most prominent one being the black dragons. She had seen many members of the dragon races, but none of them sported black scales. But she had heard of one before, although she couldn't put her talon on it. 
Digging a little further into her mind she found it. That's right the only recorded black dragon, is the dragoness Cinder, the terror of the skies. Well if I suppose this means that Zekeler has come across a dark artifact of great power if it can corrupt and control dragons. She stared at the two black dragons and Zekeler, catching sight of the golden staff in Zekeler possession. I guess that's what he's using to control them then, Lord Ryujin will what to hear about this right away, she muttered to herself hastily. She was about to turn to the vast sea behind her and prepared to fly back to the capital, but before she took flight a nagging thought about the injured blonde was poking her in the head. She hesitated and gazed back where the cheetah had retreated to. As important as it was to get the info back to Lord Ryujin, if he found out she had left an injured party behind on her watch, she would not only have her head. Dot but Lord Ryujin would be have steamed eagle for dinner. The thought of that punishment coming true was too much for her. So finally deciding she took flight toward the cheetah's path. Below from Silver Wind, Lord Zekeler spent several minutes in joyous thought about how his power could give him even more wealth now, among pointless other thing from his desires called for. The self center mole couldn't help but smile and laugh evilly though his teeth to laugh loud straight toward the sky like a lunatic, but right at that moment in time Zekeler saw a very brief flash of silver making his blood run cold. Quickly breaking from his greedy fantasies, Zekeler began looking around in a panic, the only time a flash of silver was ever seen by any criminal in Esrecedian territory, was when King Ryujin had his personal spy master Silverwind in the area. Of course this was nothing but a myth, aside from Silverwind being real and her being Ryujin's spy master, but Zekeler not knowing this was now steeped in a panic most would think worse than death. Well what are you two waiting for go after her? Zekeler yelled at the two dragons beside him. The two gave nothing more than a look slight look toward the sky before looking blankly back at Zekeler unable to spot who he was talking about. What are you looking at me for? Go. The little mole yelled at the two dragons but they simply did nothing toward his commands. The mole face if you could see it was turning red. In anger Zekeler gripped the gold staff and started banging it against the ground out of frustration. Hum, it seems Lord Zekeler took notice of me. Silverwind mused to herself. She gave a slight smirk she knew what was probably bugging Zekeler, all the myths criminals had spread about her and knowing the paranoid mole that Zekeler was he was probably nearly ready to bust a blood vessel from his panic, but she quickly put him to the back on her mind and kept following the cheetah. After running a fair distance away from the dragons and Zekeler and at the pace he was running Hunter nearly collapsed from exhaustion, setting the ninja down Hunter quickly tried to address Naruto's wounds. Where Cinder had sunk her teeth into Naruto was completely mangled mess of venom and blood sat leaking and festering in the wound. Hunter was well versed in much of the venom and poison classes he quickly moved to cure Naruto, from a small pouch on his belt Hunter withdrew a small glass vessel with glowing water contained within it. Hunter poured it over Naruto wounds, as the pure water made contact with the wound and venom itself Naruto body began to convulse violently. You fool! A female voice said sharply behind Hunter, causing the cheetah to take away his and grab his bow and quickly drew it at whoever was behind him, which was a silver feather eagle, to which Hunter merely cocked his eyebrow at. You can't cure venom like that, simply with such common remedies, she chastised him. And pray tell who are you? Hunter asked, he really didn't want to get into a conflict with the condition Naruto was in right now. One who know more than you at the moment now move aside. She demanded, without so much of a word, she just brushed past Hunter and landed right next to Naruto. It already bad, not much can be done, she murdered to herself. I going to have to bring you with me. As she continued she the strings tighten on the cheetah's bow. I asked who you are, Hunter demanded, he didn't know really what was happening at this moment, but he knew Naruto condition was only going to get worse so he needed to end this now. Calm yourself cheetah of avatar. I am an Ebony of the Esrecedian Kingdom, I am Silverwind personal advisor to the Dragon King Ryujin. She introduced herself. As much as a fascinating conversation that we are having as I am trying to think of a way to help your friend. Hunter sighed and withdrew his bow. It wasn't like he had much of a choice anyway, standard medians wasn't working and had little to no choice in this matter. Fine then so what do we do here? There isn't much I can do aside from slowing it down so let go ahead and get that out of the way. She stated, she placed one of her wings over the gash in Naruto's wound, and something like snow began to fall from her wing and cover Naruto's wound and began to freeze it shut. 
How in the realms did you do that? Hunter asked amazed that creature aside from a dragon could have any control over the cold. It comes with the job. Silverwind responded to him. Now please stand still and aside Cheetah. She stated and she began scrawling on the ground with one of her talons. And why should I exactly? Hunter questioned. So I can get your friend the help he needs, and to avoid Lord Ryujin's wrath. She said muttering the last part of her sentence. As she did this she had finished scrawling a complex circle pattern on the ground. And what pray tell how is this going to help Naruto? Oh just stay silent for a second and you'll see. Before Hunter could even cock an eyebrow, their little group vanished in a flash of light. In the Esrecidian capital, the Esrithian throne room was a dear come to life for any architect or master craftsman, as the floors were laid with a polished marble the walls were crafted from diorite a very hard mineral to shape and form six columns sat in two rows of three on each side of the throne room forming a pathway between the throne room doors to the throne, midway between the two was a very old circle written in very ancient magic contented within itself. Ryujin sat in the throne room of Esrithian holding his face in his claws, his head hurt and he could feel the sear heat spawned from anger coursing through his icy veins. I just don't get it Nagafin, no matter what I do I can't seem to move the realms into the direction of peace. He said lowly frustrated at his own, failed, efforts to stabilize the realms into a time of peace. You really shouldn't be worrying of such problem of this caliber at your young age. Replied the being Ryujin was speaking to. He was Nagafin, the captain of Esrithian Royal Guard and a general in the armed defense force of the nation. The male was a rather tall panther, wearing a full suite of sharp dark blue armor with gold trim. He was also more or less, the nanny of the young Lord Ryujin. You've already stressed yourself to the point where you've become sick. Nagafin continued. Ryujin gave the panther a slight glance before returning his attention to his headache and brushing off Nagafin's remark altogether. What happens to me barely matters, as long my nation is threatened, no matter the state of my health nor my personal life shall get in the way of protecting them. Ryujin declared though the state of pain he was in. But young lord, Nagafin exclaimed, Ryujin shot the panther a very sharp glare, making him wince. Enough Nagafin, this is the last time I want to hear of this. Ryujin growled out at Nagafin. Now between a meeting with a former friend turned warmonger, a problem up north in Driftwood, and listening to the concerns of my general for the third seventh time today. I am going to retire to my chambers now. He grunted out before leaving his throne and began to leave the room, but immediately as he was leaving the circle in the throne room began to glow brightly gaining both Nagafin and Ryujin's immediate attention. If one of our agents are having to that emergency escape spell, something must be terribly wrong. Nagafin stated. As much as I would prefer not to deal with anything else today, I suppose it requires my attention. Ryujin muttered and turned to Nagafin. Nagafin go and wake the healers and the other royal personnel, and if they complain about what hour it is tell them they'll spend their weekend asleep in ice. Right away my lord, Nagafin confirmed before bolting out of the throne room and toward the town. Ryujin watched the circle with a strange calmness to him. As if things weren't bad enough. Now if one of my spies had to get away quickly, things must be decaying away quickly in one of the other nations. He said to himself in a foreboding tone, he ready himself for the worst. If it was his spy in Rack's nation this could mean that Rack had finally worked up the gall to begin plans for war with the other nations. The light exploded blinding the young lord before slowly dying down, and what was lying in in the circle truly did surprise the young ice dragon. Ryujin's mind ran quickly as he analyzed what was in front of him. Three figures laid in front of him, passed out from never using teleportation before, he surmised, and it was true if someone was never prepared for such a power the mostly like result was death or at least passing out. But which one of his agents would use it without any preparation? Then his eyes caught the sight of the silver feathers of Silver Wind. Of course it's her, none of my other agents would be so careless with such a great power. But still why would she use it? His eyes ran across the cheetah nothing seemed off about him that differed him from other cheetahs. His gaze shifted and began analyzing, a creature which he had never seen before. But the new creature aside Ryujin's eye locked onto a wound on its arm covered in ice and sensed a dark and vile energy pulsating from it. So that's why she used it, and while a clear violation of her orders, she did nearly end up killing herself, 
she is so foolish, but that aside what is that vile power I'm feeling? Ryujin thoughts were interrupted when Nagafin came rushing back into the castle. I have brought them as you requested, Lord Ryujin. Nagafin declared saluting, which most of the assembled staff did as well. There is no need for the war strategists or the general you may all leave. Ryujin said calmly, whether confused or just happy to leave to get back to bed the assembled men left the throne room. Nagafin, the situation has been confirmed and has changed, he explained. Now I have one more request for you, in occurrence with this. Yes Lord Ryujin, remove Silverwind and that cheetah from the room. Nagafin noticed Spymaster Silverwind on the ground along with a cheetah, and the final creature which took his breath away, and took in movement from his body. A Xenosane, Nagafin gasped, Nagafin, Ryujin said firmly, snapping the royal captain from his stupor and reminding him of his orders, Nagafin quickly executed Ryujin's orders and removed them from the room, of course leaving Naruto lying where he was. After that was done and over with Ryujin took flight and land back on his throne and laid down, his eyes locked on the vile energy pulsating violently from the body. What a strange creature, he does bear a great resemblance to those who saved us thousands of years ago from that vile demon. Anyway I can see that Silverwind tried to help him with the power I gave her, but sad to say even my powers can't halt or even help cure such a plight. Ryujin mumbled to himself, as he observed he thought he felt, something of an itch, something knocking at the walls of his mind. Frowning Ryujin sent out a mental pulse from his mind trying to find the source of the itch, but when he did this several flames burst forth into existence in the room. This caught Ryujin off guard enough to make him jump up and his body become tense with fear. What how is that even possible? Ryujin quaked in fear something that was vastly unknown to the ice dragon. There are three no five life forces emitting from his being. How is that possible? It just plain shouldn't be. What kind of freakish force could forge such a thing? Ryujin felt panic running though him at that instance but quickly clammed himself. Just what are you Zeno saying? Just as he asked that Naruto began to shift and slowly stand up, then quickly rushed at Ryujin. In Naruto's mind, the bare bone corpse of Kyubi laid motionless and nearly dead in the wake of the poison that had eaten away at it. Now that poison was somehow communicating with Naruto and had taken on a form akin to a dragon, but was really nothing more than a barely formed blob, with a meaning aura. I said release me child. The poison demanded, now stop quivering. It was true Naruto had no idea what he was looking at and he was quaking in fear. He had the gall to fight Orochimaru, take a hole through his chest to try to save a friend and basically order the Kyubi to hand over its power. But when he looked whatever as was in the eyes, he just froze up with fear with no reason at all. Tisk, if you're just going to stand there and not listen to me I'll make you do my bidding. Then Naruto felt a shooting pain in his arm. Wait what's happening? Naruto said in panic, it felt as if something was growing though his arm and trying to control him. Can't really figure it out can you? The poison taunted, you cannot resist me, it stated watching Naruto in amusement. Naruto tried desperately to keep his arm from moving against his will, but it was all in vain all nothing more than entertainment for the being controlling him making the creature smile at his plight. You see Naruto no one can resist me, I am the darkness of this world and nothing gets in my way. Naruto eyes were glazed over with pure terror, he couldn't speak, he could barely resist its control, and he couldn't understand what was only thing he could do was watch as his arm dragged him closer to the cage and closer to ripping off the seal. It was the only an inch from ripping off the seal, when Naruto mustered some nerve, whipping out a kunai from his pouch and stabbed it into his right arm. Naruto kneeled over in pain, digging the shinobi knife into his arm sending sheer pain though his body, breaking the creature's control over him, but still unable to speak or really think because of the terror running though him. The poison greatly reveled in Naruto pain and fear. You are certainly an interesting one, not many beings I could think of would purposely hurt them themselves while still in great fear. While I would love to making you quake at my being more, it seems your time is up. The poison stated, the creature made of poison then instantly was frozen over by a thick sheet of rapidly progressing ice. Naruto's fear spiked greatly throwing the shinobi, from his metal world and back into the real world. Back in the real world, Naruto slowly opens his eyes only to close them as the bright sunlight reaches them. Naruto's head was ponding, and he tried to rub his head, with his hand, only find that he cannot move it. 
He quickly opened his eye and saw that most of his body was covered in ice. Naruto examined his body, and noticed that he had his right arm extended. Following up his arm, he saw that he was holding a kunai, but what Naruto saw next, made his blood run cold, and his eyes go wide. In front of Naruto, stood a young white dragon, that were only a little taller than the ones he fought not too long ago, by a few inches. The dragon's breath began to stager, and a small amount of blood ran down the corner of his mouth, as the pointed end of Naruto's kunai lay embedded, in his chest. A shocked look was plastered on the dragon's face, as he slowly moved backwards, slowly removing the shape object out of his chest. Naruto remained speechless as he watched this. The kunai made a slight noise as it was removed for the white dragon's chest. Naruto tried to move his body to help the dragon, however both of his legs were frozen to the ground along with his torso, left arm and most of his right arm. The dragon staggered backwards a little before placing a paw over the wound on his chest. The mortal wound was slowly inked in ice, however the blue ice surrounding it slowly turned a sickly purple. Naruto watched as the dragon's expression went from shock, to pure rage. The dragon's talons scrapped across the floor while ice formed around them, as he balled his paws, and he also bared his teeth. Naruto also noticed that an intense fire was burning in his eyes. Before Naruto could say anything, Ryujin formed ice around the base of his tail, and swung it at Naruto. The ice holding the orange ninja shattered with ease as the tail collided into Naruto's gut, before sending him soaring across the room. Naruto landed on the cold, hard, stone floor with a thud. The attack left Naruto dazed for a moment. Naruto suddenly felt a large amount of pain in his leg as he began to stand up. He quickly noticed that a small ice shard was embedded into his leg. Before Naruto could do anything about it, he noticed that Ryujin had launched a large volley of small ice shards towards him. In response Naruto quickly jumped out of the way, of the oncoming attack. Just as Naruto landed, he saw a small white orb land next to him, which when it hit the ground, exploded sending Naruto backwards a short distance before having completely encase him in midair. Naruto struggled to get free, and he heard the ice beginning to crack, however before Naruto could break free, Ryujin had ran up to him. In a quick motion, Ryujin spun his body, and formed a cyclone around him filled with what Naruto guessed was large ice shards. Just before Naruto could free himself the attack was launched at him. The ice casing around Naruto like before shattered quickly however, Naruto was hurled around in the cyclone, while at the same time being bumbled and cut by the ice shards inside. Pain was coursing through Naruto's body, as he did his best to cover up his body to protect it from the ice shards. Naruto quickly used his shadow clone jutsu to create two clones of himself, however they disappeared in a puff of smoke as they were shredded by the ice shards as well. Soon the cyclone subsided, and Naruto fell onto the ground once more. Naruto was covered from head to toe in cuts and bruised. He tried to stand up only for his body to give up on him. Damn it, move it already, thought Naruto to himself. Naruto then tried to tap into the Kyubi's chakra, only to find that there was nothing left. Ryujin noticed Naruto's inability to stand up, and was tempted to finish Naruto off for good. Just before he could however, a great burst of pain burst through his chest from his major wound. Damn it, I won't last much longer, I need medical attention now. Where is that panther, when I need him? Thought Ryujin. Almost as if, Nagafin heard what Ryujin was thinking, he walked through the doors. He had returned to offer assistance with the Xenosame, only to find Ryujin and Naruto both majorly wounded. Nagafin quickly ran up to Ryujin and asked, Are you alright sire? Ryujin glared at Nagafin, of course he was not alright, however instead of yelling at the panther, he said with a great amount of anger in his voice, I'm fine, just take this Xenosane and throw him into a jail cell. Nagafin was about to protest this idea, thinking that Ryujin need assistance being escorted to the infirmary, however Ryujin glared at Nagafin with a look that told Nagafin that he did not want to be questioned. Nagafin did as he was told and roughly picked up Naruto and took him to the dungeon. Ryujin on the other hand, quickly ran as fast as his wound would let him, to the infirmary. Ryujin was able to reach the infirmary, and when he stepped inside the nurse inside gasped at the condition the king was in. The nurse quickly ran out the door to get some supplies to help the king. 
Inside the infirmary, Ryujin noticed that Silver Wind was awake. King Ryujin, what happened? Are we under attack? She asked with concern for the king's health. No we are not under attack but, when I was inspecting, the other male that you brought here, he took out this knife-like object and stabbed me in the chest. I was lucky enough to freeze the boy before he dug the knife too deep into me. A look of pure fear ran across Silverwind's face. I am terribly sorry King Ryujin, I had no idea such a thing would happen. Silverwind began to shack in fear of what is to become of her. We shall discuss what is to happen once everything is taken care of, said Ryujin, his voice laced with anger, just before the nurse came back into the infirmary. There Naruto sat shivering in a prison cell just mere minutes after his fight with Ice Prince Ryujin. And was now busy thawing out. What the hell happened when I was in my mind? Naruto thought too cold to do anything else. Was I the one who left the wound on that dragon? Naruto wondered remembering the inflected wound. Shit. Naruto mentally cussed. Nothing is going right now. How am I supposed to save Sasuke like this? Just then a bright blue glow began to shine from Naruto's pocket. E.H. was the only thing Naruto said as the fragment of crystal that Ignatius gave him floated out several feet in front of him, and began spinning rapidly creating a torrent of wind strong enough to blow out the iron bars of Naruto's prison cell. Suddenly it cast a bright light blinding Naruto, and there just a few seconds later stood the chronicler Ignatius. With Ryujin. The Dragon Prince winced and grimaced as his wound was being stitched together by Nagafin. I am sorry about this Lord Ryujin, but this is the best we can do right, being that we're short of healing crystals, Nagafin apologized to the prince. It's understandable Nagafin I made that decision now, Ryujin said coldly and the glared at Silverwing who was perched nearby and sweating bullets at the Ice Dragon's stare. So what reason, did you have to activate it? Ryujin said coldly. You know that magic is purely for emergencies only. W well it wasn't as an emergency Lord Ryujin. The eagle steeled herself against the dragon cold stairs. Zekeler has found a way to take control of the minds of dragons. What do you mean Silverwing? Asked Ryujin, his mind being taken off of his treatment. Silverwing shifted nervously on her perch. He has already taken control of two young dragons, around your age sir. She said greatly unnerved knowing what Ryujin's reaction might be. A low growl of disdain emitted from the ice dragon, but quickly died down as the dragon gained a very rare smirk on his maw. In all truth I never expected that little dastard would actually would attain an artifact with such an ability, Ryuin said completely entertain with the new situation at hand, grimacing one more time as the doctor finished bandaging the wound and bidded farewell to the young prince, Ryujin continued. Hum. Send word to Lord Zekeler, I wish to have meeting with him. The smirk on Ryujin's ma only grew. That was until a large gust of wind came barrel though the door of the hospital wing, sending the door flying across the medical room and barely gave the spymaster of Esriseeth any time whatsoever to dodge, where otherwise she would have been squished. The hell, Nagafin yelled in surprise drawing his sword from his side, standing ready for whatever was on the other side of the door. Silverwing hid up in the higher rafters within the throne room, noting wanting whatever did that to come after her convexly and Ryujin wore a rare look of surprise, as the dragon hadn't expected a door to go flying across throne room. His attention was trained keenly on the door as they heard footsteps and voices coming from it. Are you nothing more than a magnet for trouble young one? An elder dragon's voice was heard. Well yeah, I get that sometimes, Naruto said walking in beside a adult teal dragon. As soon as they came into the room both Ignites and Naruto found themselves quickly suspended in the air constricted by tendrils of ice sticking out from the wall. Oh come on I just finished getting warm form the last one. Naruto yelled, however in contrast to Naruto, Ignites was rather amazed by the animated ice. Well I am impressed, Lord Ryujin. Ignatus spoke, for an ice dragon to move his ice so fluently, that is quite the rare ability, quite amazing. The scroll on you made no mention of this, the smirk Ryujin had before was gone, but just a grim look of annoyance at the two. You talk quite strongly for one who was in the death grasp of an ice dragon. Ryujin mused. Please, Prince Ryujin you should know these cannot hold me. A second later as Ignatius's eyes glowed and the ice grabbing onto both him and Naruto shattered letting them go ignites just simply landed on the ground, but for an unprepared Naruto his face gracefully met the floor. Hey warn me before you do that. 
said Naruto as he jumped up holding a bleeding broken nose. Sorry young one. The former fire dragon apologized. Hum, stand down Nagafin, Ryujin told the royal guard captain, before sighing. Okay fine you're the chronicler then, right? Indeed, your lordship. He said bowing to the prince. Okay then, answer me these three questions. 1. Who is this, surly short troublemaking being here? 2. Since you freed him from his cell I assume he is on some world-saving quest yes. And 3. The Ice Lord continued on. Why do I have to deal with this, and why did he attack me? Long story short, this young one here is Naruto Uzumaki a being from another world. And no he isn't on any sort of quest just more or less of a favor to me. Also I wouldn't know why he would attack you. He admitted eyeing Ryujin's stitches. All eyes in the room turned to Naruto looking for an answer. Naruto feeling their gaze lowered his head hiding his eyes, not really wanting to answer. Ryujin shifted his eyes at the young ninja and said, Was it one of the other life forces inside you? Naruto shifted in surprise at the dragon prince's question. Hum I thought so, but be that as it may I can't let someone as dangerous as you go, just because you weren't in control. Oh come, Naruto snapped, look I'm sorry that whatever is in me tried to kill you, but I don't have time for this I have to go after that prick, making Ryujin cocked an eyebrow. I would assume you're talking about Zekular right? To which Naruto nodded, hemp. Well as far as you're concerned at the moment that's far from the current problem, the prince said harshly, before turning his gaze to the chronicler. And you despite you being to chronicler, you have absolutely no business. Coming to my realm and busting out those who I have imprisoned, now be gone chronicler you are not welcome in my realm. Then in an instant he vanished and the crystal holding his presence there, chattered to the floor. The White Isles. Ignatius stood still concentrating his energy into his projection through the orb, and right as Ryujin on the other side announced that he was no longer welcome, he felt his energy slingshot back at him causing the elder dragon to stumble backwards. Shaking his head Ignatius was rather impressed with the young prince's abilities. It's good to see the future has such intelligent ruler in it. Ignatius chuckled to himself and began channeling his energy again. Back in Esriseeth, wait what the hell just happened? Naruto yelled, shocked at Ignatius's sudden disappearance. Nothing you need to concern yourself with. Ryujin was cut off as the crystal on the floor began chackling and sparking with energy, it launched itself into the air and again took the form of the current chronicler once again. I thought I sent you away, said Ryujin, angered by the reappearance of the chronicler. You did, and I must say that to even do that, I'm quite impressed. Still I am here because I have proposition to make with you Lord Ryujin, one that could solve both your and Naruto's problem. All you have to do is let him go and, said Ignatius. I don't need your help at all, and there is no way I'm just going to let him go, said Ryujin interrupting Ignatius. Not even if it means curing Sarah, asked Ignatius. You leave her out of this, said Ryujin, his anger beginning to boil at the sound of that name. We have everything we need right here to help her. Who is Sarah? asked Naruto, however both Ignatius and Ryujin ignored Naruto's question and continued their argument. You may think so but I can assure you that if you don't accept my offer, then she will die, said Ignatius becoming slightly annoyed by the young king's stubbornness. Is that a threat? asked Ryujin as B began to bare his teeth. No it's a fact, shouted Ignatius. Then he took a deep breath, expelling all anger from his body. Look, in a week, her heart will finally give out, and there will be nothing you can do to stop it. If you truly want to save her, then listen to what I have to say. The room went quiet for a short while before Nagafang spoke up. My lord, maybe it wouldn't be such a bad idea to at least listen to him. Like Ignatius, Ryujin let out a sigh, though more in frustration. Yes I know, fine then what do you have in mind? Said Ryujin to Ignatius. Well I am sure you have heard the legend of the Sanabat Omnis. Asked Ignatius. I have, though I am led to believe that it was only an urban legend said Ryujin. I assure you that it is in fact real, Ignatius said with a grin. All right then, why do I need this orange maniac's help in retrieving it? Ryujin said while glaring at Naruto. Well as you know, it is a very powerful artifact, so naturally it would be heavily guarded with traps and similar things. 
I have also seen the skill Naruto here possesses and I can tell you know that he is the only one here capable of retrieving it, said Ignatius with great confidence. Ryujin continued to glare at Naruto before turning his attention to Ignatius. And do I have your word that Naruto is the only one that is able to save Sarah? Yes you have my word as the chronicler, that Naruto is the only one with the skills needed to save her, said Ignatius. And do I have your word that once I let you go free you will retrieve the Sanabat Omnis and not run away? Asked Ryujin. Of course I will retrieve this Sasabat oneness for you. If it means saving your friend, and getting me out of trouble then consider it done. All right then you may leave, but your feline friend stays here. Now be gone, said Ryujin. Ignatius, bowed to Ryujin one more time, before turning around and left the room, with Naruto following right behind him. Once they were out of sight, Nagafin asked, My liege, do you honestly think that this Xenosane can actually help? Ryujin began rubbing his head with a paw while letting out a groan. Not in the slightest, I mean he couldn't even pronounce it correctly, but if the chronicler says that he is the only one, then what other choice do I have? I wouldn't think about it too much my lord, we have more important business to take care of anyway, said Silverwing. Right, come with me to the throne room, we shall discuss what we are to do with Zekler there, said Ryujin before walking out of the infirmary, followed by Nagafin and Silverwing. Over with Naruto and Ignatius, they were still walking in the hallways of the palace when Naruto asked, so why am I the only one who can get this, whatever it's called? I mean you dragons can fly and breathe fire and stuff, asked Naruto confused. Well in all honesty anyone could have gotten it, if anything it would make things more challenging for you to get it than if a dragon were to get it, said Ignatius with a straight face. Naruto gave Ignatius a deadpan face, before shouting, then what the hell did you put me on this mission then? Calm down young one, I only said those things so that it would get you out of trouble with King Ryujin. However do not expect me to help you out every time you need it. I am very busy, so think of this as a one-time thing. Yea I figured as much. Still what is this artifact that I'm looking for even do? Asked Naruto. Well you see the Sanabat Omnis is an artifact rumored to have healing capabilities, and could cure any ailment, or so that is what is how the legend goes. All right then where is it now? Asked Naruto. Come with me and I will show you, said Ignatius. The two continued to walk through the hallways until they come to what seemed like a dead end until Ignatius press one of the bricks in the wall, causing a secret door to open. When it fully opened it revealed a tunnel leading downwards. A sudden chill run through Naruto as he stared down the dark tunnel. What down there? Asked Naruto. You see Naruto in case there is a raid upon this castle and the current king and or queen need to escape, this secret tunnel was made for them to sneak away. It leads down to the ancient ruins of the palace that was once built here. I must warn you though, the palace is very old, and the body structures of the buildings are not as reliable anymore, said Ignatius. All right then, lead the way, said Naruto stepping out of the way for the elder dragon to step through first. Sadly this is where we must part. Naruto, said Ignatius. What? yelled Naruto. I do apologies but I have been here for far too long, and I must return to my duties at the White Isle. So you must go alone down there. But where in the world am I going to find this relic? You said there is a palace down there, how am I supposed to find it in there, when I don't even know what it looks like? Said Naruto with a conserved look on his face. I can tell you this much, it is hidden in a secret room in the throne room. When you find this room, you will be able to tell what the Sanabat Omnis is when you see it, said Ignatius as he started to fade. Now then you must go and with quick haste. Trouble is afoot and you must find it quickly, and with that said, Ignatius disappeared and the crystal fell to the floor once more. After picking the crystal back up, Naruto gazed into the tunnel once more. Nervously he stepped forward into the tunnel. We say that the light from the hallway that he was just in, quickly disappeared into the darkness, as if the shadows were engulfing the light. Still nervous, he took a few more steps forwards. Suddenly the door behind him shut, and all the light disappeared, leaving Naruto in the pitch blackness. Much to his relief, a torch that hung on the wall was lit. Naruto presumed it was light from some sort of magic, but he didn't really care all that much. Any light whether magical or not, was better than walking around in the dark. He took the torch from off the wall, and began to descend deeper into the tunnel. 
Naruto gave nervous glances as he descended down the tunnel. The torch in his hands providing just enough light to see a few feet ahead of him, but any farther was pitch dark. Man this place is creepy, Naruto mumbled him himself. He then quickly shook his head, come on Naruto get a hold of yourself, you have gone through much scarier places than this, he said out loud. Just as he said that his foot got snagged on a rock, and he fell. His body tumbled and rolled down the tunnel as he grunted every time he hit the ground and rolled. He soon came to a stop as he reached the end of the long tunnel. He slowly stood up, using his left hand to rub his sore head. All of a sudden, he could smell smoke, and he felt a burning sensation coming from his right arm. He looked over to his right, and saw that his right arm sleeve was lying in his torch's fire. He screamed in panic, and quickly started waving his arm in the air trying to put it out. Small embers fell off of his coat, and disappeared as it hit the floor. His constant shaking did eventually put his arm out, though it left a black scorch mark on his orange coat. Picking up the torch, he began to survey his surroundings. His mouth dropped, as he saw standing in front of him a large, rotting wooden door. This must be the right place, Naruto thought to himself, as he walked forwards and pushed one of the doors open. As soon as he began to push it, there was a loud crack, and the door toppled over, causing it to shatter into splinters as it hit the ground with a large bang. Naruto stood there motionless, still trying to process what just happened. I guess I better be very careful here, Naruto mumbled to himself. I think that was rather obvious, Kit, Kayubi mumbled weakly to Naruto. Oh you're alive, after seeing that pile of bones of you, I figured you died. Good to see that even in near death you're still a smartass said Naruto as he began to walk through the doorway not sure if he should to be happy or sad that Kayubi isn't dead. My body might be mostly gone, but my chakra is still very much alive. Besides, my body shall grow once more, once this poison is removed. Now why did you have to say that? Now I don't want to find this artifact, said Naruto sarcastically. Naruto heard a growl from the tailed fox, before things went quiet. It wasn't until shortly after when Kayubi spoke up. How do you even know if this artifact will even cure you of this poison or even if that spoiled prince will even let you use it? I don't, said Naruto as he climbed over large rocks which once were part of the wall. Then why do you help them? You can easily just run away and never worry about them, asked Kayubi curiously. Well first off, that would be a terrible idea, as the poison would still be inside me, and secondly I'm not a coward. They need my help so I'm helping them, Naruto said with confidence. At first there was silence. Naruto waited for the Kayubi to reply, and when he did he was surprised to hear instead of words, he heard laughter. What is so funny? he asked. As noble as that might be, I find it very ironic, Kayubi said while snickering some more. You were dragged here because you though by gaining this imaginary power that I mentioned before, thinking that it would help you find Sasuke who you claim, needs help seeing the light or whatever. Then when you said you would help that old iguana save his buddies, which brought you into this abysmal place all because you wanted to help some spoiled brat's little friend. Don't you see what all of your, helping, has gotten you into? Well what else am I to do? As long as I'm stuck here, I might as well help the locals, said Naruto. And you are aware that a fourth of these locals that you have met, has tried to kill you right? Naruto stopped walking as something came to his mind. Are you telling me, that you're afraid of them? Naruto heard a growl echo throughout his mind once again. Of course not, you mindless kit, however if you haven't noticed, you have been nearly killed twice so far, and it hasn't even been a week since we got here. If anything I'm more worried about your clumsiness will get us both killed, roared Kayubi. Well maybe if you didn't trick me into coming here, none of this would have ever happened. Naruto yelled, he then let his anger take control and began stomping off, not caring about his surroundings. This proved to be a large error, as the ground suddenly began to crumble beneath him. All of a sudden the ground behind him crumpled. He turned around and looked at the hallway behind him. He quickly noticed that the ground behind him, begun to break apart and fall into the black abyss below, and soon after the ground his own feet began to give way as well. Naruto made a quick dash to the end of the hallway as the floor began to crumble. Like a domino effect, as one small portion of the hall fell, so did the next. 
The crumbling ground nearly caught up to Naruto, before he reached the end of the hallway, and quickly turned the corner. After making sure the ground won't going to break or anything, Naruto peeked around the corner and looked down the hallway he was once in. The flooring had completely fallen apart, falling into the dark void that was below. Kayubi did not need to say a thing, as Naruto could feel the fox's cold glare on the back of his head. All right, I will try to be more careful, said Naruto with a groan. Exclamation mark, hash dollar percent carrot and asterisk. Ignatus was hard at work, flipping through yet another book like he has been the past couple of days. As he read through the final pages, he let out a groan before closing the book, and placing it on a small stack of books, that he had already read through, none of which contained the information he needed. He sat there thinking, unsure if he will ever find any information on how to get Naruto back. He then decided to work on some of his other duties. Walking over to the large crystal, he gazed upon the blue surface. As he did, a blurry image grew upon the crystal. As the image became clear it showed Ryujin upon the crystal. Now what do you have to do with all of this? Though Ignatus out loud. Going on a hunch, Ignatus searched for Ryujin's book, and searched through the pages when he found it. As he read through the pages, he read about Ryujin's childhood, and all that came along with being at such a young age. As he read further into the book, the gloomier, and saddening it became, from what happened to his parents, to his friend Sarah. Eventually he caught up to a more current time, which he more skimmed through seeing as most of it was stuff that he already knew happened. It wasn't until several pages after, did he stop as he might have found something of use. He read about Ryujin and four other dragons, and how they can help Naruto. Interesting, Naruto would want to hear about this, Ignatus thought to himself. He then left the book upon the podium and walked over to the blue crystal again. He was just about to contact Naruto once more, when a new image appeared on the crystal. Oh no, this is not going to end well, Ignatus said out loud. Exclamation mark, hash dollar percent carrot and asterisk. So you are Lord Zekeler, Ryujin said as he cast an unbelieving eye at the trembling mole noble in front of him. Even though Zekeler had two of the strongest dragons alive at his side under his control, he still trembled in fear at the aura of Ryujin's authority as his ruler. One of my spies has informed me that you have come across an artifact, but not just any of those faux magic ones that won bow in the past, but one that can control a dragon, am I right? S so what if I have come across it? Zekeler yelled, mustering up enough nerve to do so. Does my power threaten your rule? Zekeler accused pointing the golden staff right at the king of Esriseth, and the dragons beside him began to snarl. So I guess that's the artifact controlling the two beside him, I better be careful how I go about this, Ryujin thought. How dare you threaten Lord Ryujin? Nagafin yelled at the mole his hand going right toward his weapon. Calm yourself Nagafin, Ryujin calmly, demand of his captain, making Nagafin stay his blade and go silent. No Zekeler I don't view it as a threat, Ryujin started as he got up from his throne and walked right toward Zekeler. In fact I see it as a great opportunity. He boasted stopping right eye front of the staff. What do you mean? Zekeler asked with surprise, not expecting this response for the Dragon King. Ryujin merely chuckled at Zekeler's face. Do not worry I do not intend to take it away from you, he said as he walked by Zekeler and looked up towards one of the many stained glass windows that adorned his throne room. Tell me Zekeler, do you know why the realms are in such chaos and why artifacts such as yours are around? And not entirely, Zekeler admitted. It's because there's no heir to creased fall, the realms are out of balance, but that is no longer the case. Ryujin said gazing at Zekeler's staff. Why is that? Zekeler questioned not likening the stare Lord Ryujin was giving his staff he tightened his grip on it. Because Zekeler thanks to your acquisition, Ryujin said meaning his staff. We can bring the realms back into order by force. Ryujin smirked. Of course, you be at the forefront of this and in the years to come you will be showered with more money and power than you can possibly ever dream of. But there is one thing I need from you. Zekeler was caught in a monetary daze of a greed-filled dream, but the shook himself from it. And what would that be? Mole asked tightening his grip on his staff. Please relax Zekeler, I will not take it from you, but I do want to feel the power of it if only for a moment, Ryujin exclaimed, holding out one of his claws. Of course this in exchange for more power than you can imagine. 
Zekeler felt the greed and want welling up inside him immensely. Of course Lord Ryujin, Zekeler said with great haste fitting the staff into Ryujin's claw. As Ryujin gripped the staff he felt a dark vile power surge into his body, then Ryujin smirked at Zekeler and in an instant Ryujin hardened his grip on said staff and crushed it in his claw causing the staff to break in half and clatter to the floor, shocking Zekeler greatly then shortly after both Spyro and Cinder beside him both passed out. Wait but you said, I said what, Ryujin tone darkened, that I would ally myself with one who goes against my laws, you're nothing more than common scum Zekeler. He roared, making the mole fall backwards unable to move or responded out of the great fear Ryujin had instilled in him. Nagafin, Ryujin called to the royal captain. Yes my lord, Nagafin said as he came to Ryujin's side. Take Zekeler away and execute him, Ryujin announced to the captain making the mole nearly piss himself at the order. Of course my lord, Nagafin roughly grabbed the mole by the neck of his robe and began dragging him away. Now I'll show you why, you should have never had threatened Lord Ryujin. He said before dragging Zekeler away screaming. You will rue the day you tricked me rue it. Zekeler yelled at the top of his lungs before the doors closed on him cutting off Ryujin's sight of him. Ryujin pay little heed to the mole threat and brought his attention to Zekeler's two former slaves laying on the floor in front of him. I wonder how long their scales will remain black, Ryujin wondered, though he had deal with many strange magic in his kingdom before, corruption magic was one that was unknown to him. I guess I will just have to watch and wait, but as Ryujin started to turn around and head back to his throne, his attention was caught as the black scales of the two dragons began to roar of a great fire as they burned off their bodies floating away in the air as ash leaving behind the original scales the dragons possessed. That was quite fast, Ryujin thought, taking note of Spyro's and Cinder's laying in front him as the black scales finished burning away. So this is the current dragon of legend, sizing up the passed out purple dragon in front of him. Truly I'm not that impressed, Ryujin commented to himself. He then moved his sight towards Cinder. So that's the true from of the terror of the skies, quite the rare breed. Cinder as she laid sewn on the floor after her black scales symbolizing her years of service under Malefor, had burned away unveiling sleek silver scales, and a grey underbelly. So a wind dragon, for once I can say I didn't expect that, Ryujin then sighed. Now that the corruption's worn off I better get them a doctor. Exclamation mark, hash dollar percent carrot and asterisk. As Naruto descended further into the ruins, he picked up a conversation with the Kyubi about something that was bothered him. Hey Kyubi, Naruto asked hoping the Nine Tails would answer, while he was walking down an old flight of decaying stairs. What is it Kit? The Kyubi responded. What is that creature doing inside me now? Naruto asked, wondering what the creature he thought killed Kyubi. It isn't a creature Naruto, it seems to be a corruption agent, a part of that poison that's static in your system. He told Naruto. It only seemed to only come alive when you passed out and confronted it from that gash in your arm. Oh right that from huge gash on my arm, Naruto said then yelled. The huge gash in my arm. Having forgotten the injury on him. In his scare of forgetting his own large wound, Naruto had let go of the torch he was holding causing to go out as it hit the floor. Damn, Naruto cursed standing in a now pitch dark cave. You really are something special kit. The Kyubi groaned out. Shut it you overgrown fox. Naruto retorted in anger at the Kyubi's insult, just before slipping off the stair he was on and fell down the staircase yelling and cursing towards the bottom. Like I said Kit, you're something special. Kyubi said to Naruto once more. Naruto merely grunted at the Kyubi and brushed himself off. Naruto then realized that he was no longer in the dark. Hey where's this light coming from? Notice the area he was in now lit slightly. Look above you Kit the Kyubi told him. Hum, Naruto looked above him and saw a cluster of glowing crystals. Whoa that's awesome, Naruto commented. Kyubi rolled his eyes at Naruto who was fixated on the glowing rocks, and then noticed that down the hall the crystals seemed to grow in number toward a bright light, and in that direction Kyubi felt a vile power emitting from the end of the fall. Kit take your eyes off the shiny thing and get going. The Kyubi growled out to Naruto, which Naruto just seemed to ignore his gaze still fixed on the crystals. There was some sort of strange familiar feeling he got from them it felt like someone he knew, but who? Kid you still home? The Kyubi inquired, 
but got no response from Naruto. Kit. The kit soon bellowed, startling Naruto out of his trance, shaking his head Naruto mumbled out. What the heck was that feeling? Well whatever it was, forget it. The Kyubi said angrily the energy from the corridor roughing his fur. I believe what you were tasked to find is nearby. Naruto gazed down the hallway and at the light showing from it he felt the same feeling, instead this time it felt like he was being pulled towards it. Naruto steeled himself for whatever was creating the light and dashed down the hallway towards the light, wanting to follow the pull. As Naruto left the end of the hallway it broadened into a large dome-shaped room, the floor had long ago collapsed now filled with water from two large cracks in the ceiling. Near the center Naruto saw hanging from the ceiling was a large mass of crystals, wrapped in layers of vines halfway up where it met the water. As Naruto gazed at the center of the room the pull became far stronger. Hey Kyubi are you feeling this? Naruto asked the beast. What are you talking about Kit? The Kyubi responded, unable to feel the same pull as Naruto, and thought he was going a little nuts. You're not going loopy on me are you Kit? Unlike how Naruto would normally responded to the fox, he just stood silently gazing intently at the crystal in the center of the room. You know it is rude to come into a place where one slumbers and awake them, you know. Naruto broke his gaze, and nearly lost his footing into the water. Who the hell said that Kyubi? Why the hell are you asking me? Slow you own damn problems. The Kyubi bellowed back at Naruto mentally, making Naruto cover his ears physically. Quote dot dot dot, now it truly has been some time since I have heard that voice. The voice echoed again this time with surprise. Is that you Kurama? Naruto felt the nine tails withhold a gasp. Hey who are you and how can you hear the fur ball? Quote dot dot dot, well while it is more polite to introduce yourself first, I guess I'll humor you. It echoed again, out of the water rose up a humanoid shaped from water, and began to solidify. Wait that's a water clone jutsu. Naruto gasped, it took the form of a pale skinned man, wearing a white robe with, long dark brown hair and two horns sticking out upward from his forehead. The water clone slowly opened his eyes revealing something Naruto knew all too well. Chihi, the Byakugan. But how? The water clone rose up from the water below taking on the form of a man. The clone slowly opened its eyes revealing two pure white orbs. Naruto gasped in surprise he knew exactly what that was, as it was kind of hard to forget when someone pokes you with chakra nearly a hundred times over. Wait that that's the Byakugan. Naruto gasped out. Wait Kyubi who was this guy, I thought this realm didn't have any summoning contracts. He asked aloud not thinking about who was in front of him. However even though Naruto asked something of the Kyubi, the question seemed to just fly right by the fox as he saw who the water clone was of. So this is what became of you, uncle, the Kyubi said with a little venom in his voice. Wait, uncle, Naruto shouted, I am very hurt that you would take that tone with me little Kurama. The clone said teasingly with a smirk across his face. What happened to that cheerful little fox, who would never leave his creator's side, and loved him dearly? He continued. Shut up. The Kyubi or Kurama bellowed at him though his thoughts. I am in no mood even after you've been missing for thousands of years, and I am no mood for your stories of times long past. Meanwhile Naruto was drastically confused. He was having a hard time imagining the Kyubi loving anyone and well as being happy who was Kurama, and who the heck was this guy talking with the Kyubi, and how could he even hear the Kyubi and how was this guy the fox's uncle? Ah, both of you shut up. Naruto shouted interrupting the exchange between the two. Okay first off, who the heck are you, who is Kurama? He finished seething. My, a brash one, aren't you? The pale man chuckled. Very well I will answer. I am Hamura Otsutsuki uncle of Kurama who was sealed in you from what I can guess. Your name is Kurama, Naruto asked his prisoner. I always thought it was Kyubi or just Fox. The Nine Tails didn't respond to Naruto or even give a hint he even existed. Naruto's sweat dropped and sighed, well anyway aside from you being whoever you were and being the Kyubi's uncle however the hell that works. I need that crystal you're standing in front of so if you would ma. No, the Hamura cut him off. Not until you tell me your name and answer a question for me. Um, okay. Naruto reluctantly agreed. Well my name's Naruto Uzumaki, I and I'm going to be the next Hokage of my village, so, then what's your question? 
What's a Hokage? He asked plainly. Naruto faltered at his question. Are you kidding me? Naruto glared at him sternly. How can you not know what a Hokage is? Kit clammed down. As much as I would want to see you knock him flat, he wasn't even around when the villages were founded, so you can hardly blame him. Kurama interjected. What? What the hell happened to you and why the hell did you go quiet? Naruto retorted getting in an argument with Kayubi. The water clone on the other hand sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose, I guess I relied up the two of them a bit too much. Hamura thought, running through a few hand signs. He finished and said. Water release, water splash down. In the middle of their bickering Naruto became thoroughly soaked, as a torrent of water rose up from the pool and splashed over the knucklehead effectively quieting him. All right now, he clapped, now that's out of your system, I do apologize for roughing the fur of you tenant, but it seems like you're here for this crystal behind me right. The wet ninja nodded squeezing one of his sleeves dry. What for? He questioned. Well one to cure myself of something in my body and, some dragon from the surface, asked me to get it for a friend of his. Naruto answered. Well then since that's the case, if you want my coffin you have to fight me first. He smirked and got into a fighting stance that was roughly similar to Neji's stance. Wait your coffin, Naruto freaked, not didn't like ghosts or the idea of the undead very much, but as Naruto froze up Hamura rushed forward and struck Naruto right in the chest sending the ninja fly backwards into the water. Naruto quickly chambered back to the surface after the strike. What the hell was that for? Naruto barked at the water clone of Hamura. I said fight me, he said plainly. He once more got in a fighting stance. Now fight me for my coffin. Naruto had no time to think about it as he just barely noticed the water clone dash at him quickly an open palm strike aimed right at his head, only barely able to duck and jump away. Damn he's fast, Naruto commented. You're lucky that didn't strike Kit, and remember water clone only have about one tenth of the user's power. Kurama warned. TCH, why do you care now? Just piss off. Naruto yelled at the fox, before he then quickly switched to his favorite hand sign. Shadow clone jutsu, 15 clones poofed into existence beside Naruto. Get him, 14 Naruto's clones charged headfirst, toward the water clone. Is this all you have to show me? Hamura taunted, he pulled an out a sword forming it from water. He then quickly struck the first three Naruto's and dispelled them with little effort. Quickly he ran his hands though several signs Naruto hadn't seen before. Great torrent release. Swallowing sea. Hamura called out. Several tendrils shot out of the water snatching the remaining Naruto and drug them under the water and crushed them. Was that really all you had? Rasengan. Naruto shouted catching the ancient ninja off guard. Barely able to react himself, the Rasengan impacted Hamura right in the stomach and blasted the water clone apart. I must say I'm impressed, I didn't expect such young person with chakra to be that strong, or maybe 10,000 years of sleep was bad for myself. Hamura thoughts echoed throughout the room while he reformed himself. Yeah that was probably it. No, it wasn't, I blasted you apart fair and square, 10,000 years of sleep had nothing to do with it. Naruto yelled in anger at the horned water clone, although he was completely ignored by Hamura. Anyway aside from that fluke, Hamura shrugged. I guess it was a good enough job, he told a seething Naruto. Now what did you need the crystal for again? Naruto sighed. I need it to complete a job up top, a King Ryujin asked or more or less demanded that I retrieve it to heal a friend of his. Hum, well okay then let's go, he'll heal whoever he needs. Hamura said, as I can't let you take the crystal that is as it's the only thing keeping me alive, he said rolling his shoulders. I just go do it. How is it keeping you alive? Naruto questioned. Well I don't really remember why. It was 10,000 years ago, when I was more or less laid to rest in it. Hamura muttered. So aside for some reason it keeping me alive and being asleep for so long I don't really, recall, but I can heal you, it's that gash on your arm under that dragon ice right? Yeah, but how can you tell it came from a dragon? Naruto asked, completely forgetting about the Byakugan's abilities. Well, it's my eyes that let me see its energy, he said, which instantly reminded Naruto of it. Now then shall we be on our way, Hamura said as he gestured towards the exit. Naruto nodded and the two of them left the room. 
As the two of them began to walk a question popped into Naruto's mind. Hey Hamura, how did you get here anyway? Well you see, a long, long time ago, I decided that I wanted to explore the world, and see everything that the world could offer, before my time came. Much to my own surprise, our world didn't have much at the time, so I decided to journey to other realms such as this one. So that is why you left, said Kyubi with a disdainful tone in his voice. Ignoring the fox Naruto said, Really? Where else have you been? Sadly, this was the only other place that I visited. I wasted a lot of my limited time wandering our world. So I was left with little when I came here. But from what I can remember, I rather enjoyed my time while it lasted. Enthusiastic about everything as always, Kayubi growled in the same tone of voice as last time. Oh be quiet will you? Said Naruto, only to earn another growl from the fox. Be nice to him, I understand why he is in such a broody mood. I was after all his favorite family member. Be quiet old man, shouted Kayubi. Oh don't act like I couldn't tell, I saw it written all over your face, when you were younger. Naruto could hear Kayubi mumble things to himself, though he couldn't make out what the words were. Soon they came across the ruined hallway that Naruto created. Now when did this happen? Asked Hamura, casting an accusing eye on Naruto. Naruto made a sheepish smile, as he rubbed the back of his head, trying to ignore the look he was getting. Well no point in waiting here any longer, come along, Naruto watched as Hamura turned around and walked back the way they came. The inside of the castle was a complete maze, as Naruto followed the ancient ninja up and down several staircases, walked down an uncountable amount of hallways, as well as walked through some of the servant halls. It wasn't until Hamura opened one last door, when Naruto noticed that he was now outside of the castle. Finally we are out of that place, shouted Naruto. Happy now that half of his long walk back to the surface was over, Naruto began to walk forwards, only to suddenly stop just as he was about to walk off the side of a cliff. He turned around and faced Hamura who was approaching the young ninja. What the hell, why are we here? It just leads to a cliff. It's not a cliff, we are standing on the roof of this place. That hallway that you collapsed was the only way out to the front exit, so unless you wanted to walk miles upon miles in the dark just to walk around this thing, this would be the only other way to the surface. Naruto groaned not liking the situation he was in. Alright so how do we get down then? Is there a ladder or some stairs nearby? I'm afraid not, the only way down is to jump. What? shouted Naruto as he turned around to face Hamura. Seeing the hesitation of the orange ninja, Hamura grasped Naruto's shoulder, and shoved him over the edge, before shortly jumping off himself. Naruto was screaming as he fell, unsure of where the ground was as the darkness hid everything below him. Not wanting to become an orange pancake, Naruto made quickly made several shadow clones, and used them as a shield as he plummeted. Suddenly Naruto felt a sudden impact as he presumed that he hit the ground. All of his shadow clones suddenly disappeared, shielding him from most of the impact. Naruto groaned as he slowly got up, and shortly after heard Hamura safely land next to him. You alright? Hamura asked as he watched Naruto slowly get up. Oh yay, I'm just fine, Naruto said sarcastically glaring at Hamura. Good, now come along we still have more walking to do. The two continued to walk, and much to Naruto's relief nothing happened to them, nor did they have to jump down any larges highs again. Soon they reached the top of the staircase that Naruto walked down earlier that day. Placing a hand of the wall, Hamura's hand began to glow slightly before it opened as a small doorway. On the surface, Spyro slow tiredly awakened, his head was pounding. Spyro opened his eyes and lazily surveyed the room around him, several gems and different sharp tools laid on a nearby table. Over the table was a window with the evening sun just starting to set over a rather large wall in the distance. Pushing himself off the soft bedding he was laying on he thought. Wasn't I just fighting male for, what happened? He thought as he rubbed his aching head. Looking around the room once more Spyro noticed an empty unmade bed next to him and thought, Cinder, where is she? Spyro panicked, trying to keep calm though he got off the bed and began heading down a nearby staircase. As Spyro went toward the bottom floor he gazed around the bottom floor was full of crystal fragments, pots and beakers of random steaming liquids and strew about furniture. But he didn't see anyone. Damn where's Cinder, 
And where am I? He wondered. With few options Spyro decided to leave the small abode he was in. Outside Spyro was met by the sight of a large city, slowly dying down as the day ended. Spyro was amazed by the sight, the only city he had ever been in was Warfang and he thought that was massive. The buildings that surrounded Spyro's vision tore right into the skies above easily toppling the largest buildings in Warfang, in the distance far from Spyro near the center of the city, was a massive bronze statue of a four-winged bipedal dragon, towering over the entire city. So you have awakened, a rough said behind Spyro. Spinning around Spyro came face to face with Nagafin the captain of the royal guard. If you're looking for your friend she is in the palace, so please follow me he said gruffly and quickly not allowing the purple dragon to speak at all, before quickly turning around and walking towards the giant dragon. Not really understanding the situation at hand Spyro, resigned himself to follow the blue and gold armored guardsmen. As Spyro followed Nagafin though the city for some reason, he could not tear his gaze away from the giant dragon statue towering over the city. What's the matter youngling, never seen the guardian god Gwaine? Nagafin asked noting Spyro's gaze at the giant statue. No, I can't say that I have, Spyro's trailed off with his voice. A little later, they arrived at the center of the city, where the palace rested. Nagafin leads Spyro into the large building, and eventually they came to a large white room with an ice dragon laying across his throne in a bored fashion, with a silver dragoness just standing a few feet away from him. The ice dragon's eye quickly caught sight of Spyro as soon as he came in. Well it looks like your mate has arrived and is fully awake. Ryujin said sitting up, the silver dragoness in front of him quickly turned her head and locked eyes with Spyro and gave him a warm smile. Then something struck Spyro rather quickly about this dragoness. Cinder, Spyro asked unsure, yay it's me Spyro, said Cinder with a warm smile. What happened to your black scales? Spyro asked, confused. The dark magic male for put inside of me, is gone now but as for how I'm not sure, she said to Spyro, happy to see him up and about. So then where are we? Spyro asked, you're in my kingdom, purple dragon of legend, or to be more precise you're in the capital Nagapur, Ryujin could sense Spyro wheeling confusion and unease. Please calm yourself Spyro, I know you have no idea where you were and the last thing you remember is putting this world back together correct. Spyro didn't know how this young ice dragon knew about that but slowly nodded his head, I have been conversing with your mate here, during the final hours of your rest and she has told me quite a bit about the both of you, Ryujin said. As soon as Spyro mind registered the word mate, he felt his face on fire and Cinder was doing pretty much the same thing but said nothing, like Spyro. Ryujin smirked knowing he had gotten a small rise out of them both. So if you know what happened to us at the core of the world, how did we get here? Spyro questioned. Other than you being acquired by a mad nobleman and being enslaved for a short time, I really can't say where you have been. But we can get to that in a bit. I'm sure you two need some time to catch up and are still rather tried. Ryujin responded, Now I have a room ready for you two at an inn nearby, Nagafin will lead you there. I'm sorry if this seems rather abrupt but I have some rather urgent business to attend to right now. So if you would Nagafin, the royal captain bowed to the king and quickly hastened both Spyro and Cinder out with him. Now on to something more interesting, Ryujin said to himself as he heard a nearby wall open up. Back in the city, Glavarg slowly slipped his way through the alleyways of Nagapur, as much as he didn't fear the guards or people of this city. He didn't want to draw attention to himself, as it would cause possible harm to his assignment, through numerous spies and sources, Galvarg found himself heading for the holy city of the Guardian God. True being in a place like this made him sick to the very core of his soul. But he still had his mission to complete, he still had to find the traitor Cinder and the purple dragon Spyro. Just then Glavarg felt his blood run colder than his soul, for in front of him appearing out of nowhere, shadow looming over him, was a ten-foot-tall ape cloaked in deerskin bones of various fallen foes hung from his neck as if they were trophies, his fur was soaked and dried with blood giving the creature a foul stench and lastly a hood covered his face obscuring it form view aside from two blood red pulsing eyes. I'll tail it, the harbinger of mail for, what are you doing here? I'll tail it, let out a low series of growls at the new dark general. Why would I waste my time? Glavarg hollow voice echoed, in his iron armor, with such an unimportant individual. 
A series of higher growls left at Ma's, clearly showing signs of frustration at Glavard, it was holding out ones of its bloody claw threateningly at the wolf. Fine then I suppose, if Pardis wants to me deal with Ryujin I shall. Galvard told the tall ape, stepping back slightly from the beast. As long as it makes you disappear you foul harbinger. He shot at the beast in fear, and as soon as Glavard blinked behind his helmet, the beast had vanished from his sight. Though Altail it was an ally of the remnants of the Dark Army, many in the army even a few of the remaining generals feared Malefor's harbinger, seeing it as nothing more than a dark evil being far more so than Malefor himself ever was. Glavard let out a fearful sigh of relief, and began heading right for the palace of Nagapur, and for th speed Glavard possessed, it didn't take the wolf long to head to his new objective outside the Esriseeth palace Glavard took a careful glance around few guards were on duty and there were next to no deterrence keeping the thought of getting into the palace out of anyone's mind. Their defense are as lax as when Pardis murdered their king, what a foolish and arrogant race the dragons are. Galvard thought, as he slipped past several guards and began scaling the wall, halfway up the wall Galvard caught the scent of an ice dragon nearby. So that where you are, Galvard thought and quickly ripped his way up the wall, and onto the roof, gazing around Galvard thought about the best way of getting at the current king form he could just bust though one of the windows and attack but he had no idea who was guarding the king especially if that guard Captain Nagafin was still around, ultimately Galvard resigned himself to wait for nightfall and find a more opportune moment to strike. Back in the throne room, an hour later, Ryujin just stood there beyond flabbergasted, Standing beside Naruto in the flesh as far as he could tell was the first Xenosian to ever come to the Dragon Realms. I don't believe it, it's the first Xenosian. Ryujin said nearly breathless. But how is this possible? Naruto was going to say something but was stopped by Hamura when put his hand on his shoulder, and gave him a look saying let him talk, in his entire life Naruto had never had someone that could quiet him down with just a look no even Aruka could do that. Moving past Naruto. Hamura graced the Ice Dragon King and keeled before him, greatly surprising Ryujin. It has been a few thousand years since I have dealt with Dragonic royalty, but Xenosian is not what I am, so allow me to introduce myself, I am Hamura Otosuki your highness. Still kneeled Hamura, now you are the one who asked this young one to find help for a friend of yours. Barely shaken from his stupor, Ryujin barely nodded to him. Um, well yes she'll be here soon but in all Hunstati I really didn't expect this Xenosian here to come back at all, and I expected him to bring me back a crystal, not a living being. He didn't expect me to come back at all. That kinda hurts, Naruto thought depressed. Well, in truth theirs is a crystal down where he found me. Dot but seeing as it's my tomb, I can't really let anyone mess with that now can I? Hamura told him. Wait tomb, Ryujin said sharply, breaking himself from his stupor. If what you're saying is true that's makes you some foul undead creature held to this world by some dark magic no. He accused him and the air around them began growing frigged. Please calm yourself young king. Hamura requested. While the crystal is my tomb, I am am not dead. He said trying to calm the ice dragon. More like I am froze in time. So please calm yourself. Ryujin simply raised an eyebrow at him, but became less tense. So then if you're frozen in time, I suppose that doesn't count as dead. Ryujin said, but heard a small chuckle from Hamura. What's so funny? He snapped. Oh not much but you are the descendant of the first king of Esriseeth right, it just kind of funny you remind me so much of Aganair. Hamura stated with a smile. As Ryujin was going to response he felt something grab him roughly by his neck and salm him into the ground, and behind him crushing his neck was the iron-clad wolf Galvard. Ryujin wheezed as Galvard tightened his grip on the ice dragon's throat. I do not know why Pardis finds you a threat if this is how easy you go down. Glavard taunted. Then Glavard heard three knives whistle through the air and striking his armor, bouncing off of him without any damage to him. Looking up Glavard saw an upright creature he had never seen before with his arm casted to the side showing Glavard the source of the knives, was that supposed to do something? The wolf questioned as if mocking Naruto only for Naruto to growl in annoyance in return. Taking the small distraction Naruto had caused recklessly, Ryujin gathered a fair amount of ice on his tail and smashed it into Glavard's back sending the Dark General flying off of him. Thanks for doing that, Ryujin, 
coughing in between words as his lung began to refill with air. Galvarg slowly picked himself from the floor and gazed at the three begins in the room in front of him. Truly I did not believe your courtroom jesters would be a problem for me. Galvarg said flatly, but I guess I have to fight a little harder than I thought I would. You're a pest, Hamura muttered. Galvarg ignored the comment, and quickly charged towards the group, his claws ready to tear them apart. He decided if he took out the two other beings then, Ryujin would be easy pickings. He ran right past Ryujin, dodging the attack he tried to hit him with. Then the smaller of the two creatures stepped forwards, another knife-looking object in his hands. Galvard watched as the small orange creature moved his hands rapidly, before suddenly a large smoke cloud formed. Galvard quickly stopped, and waited to see if someone would jump out at him through the smoke. Much to his own surprise though, the smoke quickly disappeared to reveal that there was now a ton of copies of the orange being, at least twenty, from what Galvard could estimate. He then noticed that each of them were wielding the same knife as the original one. Galvard didn't have any time to formulate a plan, as he was quickly knocked down while he was distracted by an ice attack from Ryujin. It ice didn't piece his armor, but he could feel the slightest of dents in it. As he tried to stand, the several clones of the orange being rushed towards him, followed by the elderly-looking one. Just as he finally stood up he felt one of the knives try to pieces his armor, only for it to glance off however the force made him stumble back a bit. Then another one came near him, and he quickly lashed out one of his claws to slice the throat of the creature, only for the being to disappear into smoke when he did. Once again taken off guard by this, Galvard began to feel several more attacks collide into his body from all sides, until finally he fell onto his back. Galvard felt a sudden burst of anger rise up from him, as he quickly jumped back up and started to destroy each clone as they reached him till soon it was back down to four versus Galvard. Not giving up, the three began their attack, Naruto along with a clone of his finishing creating a Rasengan, Hamura was beginning to make several quick hand gestures, and Ryujin had just finished charging a large ice attack. Naruto quickly rushed forwards, while Ryujin and Hamura stayed back, Ryujin releasing a massive ice blast at the wolf while Hamura shot out a stream of high-pressured water. Both of their attacks flew right past Naruto, forcing Galvard to quickly dodge both of them, but in doing so left him open for Naruto to hit him with his Rasengan. Galvard felt a large pressure upon his chest where Naruto struck him. He tried to dig his feet into the ground, as he felt his body beginning to be pushed backwards giving him a small second to fight back before being tossed aside. He managed to rake his claws across Naruto's chest, leaving a deep gash, before flying backwards and smashing through a window falling to what might be his death. Naruto fell to the ground, pain exploding through his body as he began to lose a lot of blood at a quick pace. Hamura quickly checked to see what he can do to heal Naruto, while Ryujin examined the window the wolf was through out of. Peering downwards, Ryujin saw the wolf clinging onto a small ledge of a small tower nearby before he quickly picked himself up and jumping into a nearby window, the blue dragon soon took flight after the wolf. Wait where are you going? Naruto called after him, Naruto didn't get a response from him, as he dove in through the same window the wolf jumped though. Damn, Naruto thought to himself. He gathered chakra in his feet and jumped after the dragon. Catching himself on the wall right below the window the top of the tower exploded from within spanning outward was a mass of spiked ice, sending brick and mortar flying, out with it flew the blue dragon, with one claw gripping a bloody wound on his side. Damn wolf! Ryujin roared out keeping his distance hovering a ways away, Naruto watching this was now literally trying to be one with the wall having barely avoided the debris falling down the tower. Standing back up on the side of the tower Naruto saw the iron-clad wolf standing onto outcropping of ice, having a stare down with the hovering dragon. Taking this as a chance Naruto slipped out a kunai and tagged it with an explosive note, taking the best aim he could Naruto tossed it at the wolf as soon as the kunai neared the wolf with great speed, Galvard caught the kunai without turning around, but failing to notice the burning tag on it. Did you really think that would work child it didn't work the first time so why try again? Glavard chastised him, looking over his shoulder, of course as so as he finished the explosive note went of blasting the wolf into one of the spikes of ice impaling him upon it and shearing away his iron armor from his chest. 
The wolf hung there limp either dead or unconscious as Naruto made his way to an ice spike sitting next to the impaled wolf. You fool back away from him. Ryujin roared out. Huh. Before Naruto could even react, a seemingly dead Galvard hand shot forth and his claws deep into Naruto's wounded arm. You damn brat you'll pay for that. Galvard declared, pulling himself off the spike and began moving despite the hole in his chest. You may have hurt me but you cannot kill what isn't alive. As this was said Galvard was whipped aside, and toward the ground by a stream of solid water, letting go of Naruto who quickly caught himself on the side of the tower. You might be unable to die, but it seems you can be smacked around rather easily. Hamura said having appeared on a nearby spike in silence, gazing down at Galvard, the wolf easily picked himself up and cast an angry glare at the three beings high above him. Those two were far more problematic than I thought they would be. It's probably for the best that I run for now as much as I don't want to. Galvard muttered to himself, taking a step back Galvard right claw began go glow and he struck the tower Naruto and Hamura were standing on the side of, a huge wave of spiked ice exploded toward them. Naruto jumped away but lost his footing as the wall collapsed under him and the spike pierced Hamura turning him back into water. But before Naruto could plummet to the ground, he found himself griped by the jaws of Ryujin biting his collar. Soon dropping the ninja to the ground, Ryujin quickly spun in the air and took off into the city looking for Galvard. As Naruto got up off the ground, next to him a column of water rose up and took the form of Hamura. Lord Ryujin wait, Nagafin came rushing by Naruto and Hamura with a small procession of guards, in an attempt to call out to the king of aesthetic, hastily turning to the ninja Nagafin roared. What happened here, catching Sai top the tower completely manned with ice? Who did this? Lord Ryujin isn't capable of that. It was some wolf covered in some kind of metal armor. Naruto said as he got up, he heard a very sharp gritting noise coming from Nagafin. The panther was clenching his fangs and trembling in fear in his armor. So Glavarg the Slayer of Sovereigns has returned to Nagapur, mumbled the pather. A few minutes later after hearing a small tale from Nagafin, Naruto was following behind the panther going from rooftop to rooftop barely able to keep up with him. Damn. It's like trying to keep up with bushy brows. Naruto thought. It's not that kit. Kayubi told Naruto, sounding very sullen in his tone. I fear that the poison in your body is more than we think it is. That bird Silverwind said it was a poison, but I think it is something much worse. Hearing those words Naruto felt a strange fear shoot through him. Then what is it? Naruto thought back. I can't say, but it feels like it's changing your very being. Other than that I can't really say kit. Kayubi told him. Back with Ryujin. Compete lyrics outpacing both Nagafin and Naruto Ryujin was carefully serving the city trying to find anything out of place, partially trying to find the wolf. But no matter where he looked here couldn't smell, see or sense any trace of the wolf. Landing on a nearby rooftop and sat on his haunches and looked around the city frustrated with himself for being unable to locate the wolf. That was when Ryujin felt an incredibly cold figure behind him. Ryujin felt an incredible fear well up inside him as he felt nearly controlled as he looked behind him. He soon found himself face to face with the Glavard once again, the wolf quickly raised his claw and swatted at the ice dragon sending the unpaired Ryujin to the street below into a small crowd of citizens of the city scattering them. I must admit Prince Ryujin, you're a lot more troublesome than I thought you would be. Glavard said almost as if he was complimenting the dragon, watching Ryujin get on all fours and glare at him anticipating some form of attack. The wolf just chuckled at him. Don't worry Ryujin you're lucky I have far more pressing matters to attend to, so until then see ya I straight. He taunted. Glavard. Nagafin yelled at the wolf just feet above him, sword drawn and about to cleave the wolf in half. As he about made contact Glavard vanished in a white carried away by the winds. That last part makes no sense, be sure to rewrite it so that the reader knows what in the world Glavard does to disappear. Nagafin blade crashed into the roof wrecking a far part of it and caving it in with Nagafin just standing on the edge. Naruto nearby just stood there panting, having barely caught up with the guard captain, damn it was like trying to catch up with Lee. Naruto panted out, looking around Naruto saw a slightly caved in roof and a stunned ice dragon staring in fear behind him. Wait what just happened here? Naruto asked shaking himself away from his surprise. Ryujin responded to Naruto. 
nothing that really concerns you, now aside from that we have something to finish up. Ryujin snapped, in a fashion that said he would rather not acknowledge the matter of what just happened, before leaving the roof and flying off towards the palace. Geez what's his deal? Naruto muttered watching the ice dragon fly off. Back in the ninja world, it had been the better part of a week since Naruto went missing, and Tsunade was devastated when Jiraiya had told her, her office was stacked high with evil paperwork, the lights were often empty bottles of sake, littered the floor and in the middle was a passed out drunk Tsunade. Hey Tsunade are you in there? Jiraiya voice came from the other side of the office door, opening the Jiraiya was completely covered under a mountain of paperwork. HN, who's there? Tsunade muttered, awaking from her drunken sleep. Oh come on Tsunade, I know you're depressed about the brat but you can't use that as a reason to neglect your duties as Hokage. Piss off Jiraiya if I want to use that an excuse I will. Tsunade still drunk snapped at him a chucked an empty sake bottle at him, which Jiraiya dodged with ease, given how drunk she was. I just don't understand why Jiraiya everyone I try to protect, always dies Nawaki, Dan, and now Naruto in the hands of the Akatsuki. Tsunade said in a sad drunk way, Why does my luck suck so much? She asked. Well it wasn't the Akatsuki, Lady Tsunade. A cold voice said walking in behind Jiraiya who was still picking himself up. As Tsunade looked up to see who was bothering her now, her eyes widened in fear. Itachi Uchiha, she muttered. Itachi Uchiha, what the hell are you doing here? Tsunade demanded switching from a drunk stupor to one of alarm. I am not here to start conflict, Lady Hokage I am merely here concerning Naruto's disappearance. He said calmly not breaking his clam gaze. That's easy to guess Itachi, but that still doesn't say why you're here. Tsunade said roughly getting up seemly ready to slam the Uchiha through as many walls as she could. Though before she could Jiraiya intervened. Okay Tsunade hold it, now before you continue considering mopping the floor with our stoic friend here, he has been spying on the Akatsuki for me for some time now and he has come across some information about Naruto's whereabouts. Jiraiya said trying to clam and stop Tsunade from killing Itachi not that she could. You have had Itachi Uchiha spying on the Akatsuki this entire time and you haven't told me. Tsunade asked in a cold voice, with an underlying tone of wanting to kill Jiraiya. Jiraiya felt Tsunade icy tone and was ready to run away when the time warranted it. Lady Hokage before we get to that I must ask for your permission to go find Naruto. Itachi asked. This puzzled Tsunade, why would you need my permission? Because I have a debt that I must repay to my sensei, and I don't feel it would be appropriate with the permission of the Hokage, to help you find one of your own ninja. E.H. Tsunade barely responded, fine then, in the dragon realms. Naruto stood alone with a water clone of Hamura, in front of Ryujin as a mole tended to the gash on his side with Silverwing and Nagafin on each side of him. So aside from every single interception we've had here so far, I must thank Naruto Uzumaki, if you weren't here Galvard might have done away with me. Now, Naruto you might want to get Lord Hamura here to cure your element, before Silverwing's little ice seal wears off and it kills you. Crap I nearly forgot about that, Naruto muttered, looking at his arm where the ice still covered where Cinder had bit him. Hmm, you don't say, Ryujin said rather curtly. Although the comment went right by Naruto, who already had Hamura, chipping away at the ice in his arm. Hmm, this seems to be quite a lethal toxin, I suspect if it wasn't for Kurama sealed in you, you'd be dead or far worse. Hamura muttered lowly, most in the room couldn't hear him aside from Nagafin whose ears perked up at that statement. Okay Naruto stand still, this'll hurt a lot. Not giving Naruto any time to respond. Hamura already had a glob and water over Naruto's wound and had quickly extracted the poison, but to Naruto he didn't feel any pain at all. Wait I thought you said that would hurt. Naruto asked him, and Hamura simply looked at him sideways. Oh it will, your body just hasn't caught up yet, it should start hurting about right now. As Hamura said that, Naruto keeled over in pain over his throbbing arm, only able to clinch his teeth and breath heavily trying to dull the pain. Even though you're in pain at least the poison's gone, Hamura said, looking at the poison he pulled out of Naruto, in the blob of water the poison took the form of a dragon skeleton and lunged at Hamura, failing though as it was trapped in the blob, but Hamura did jerk in surprise at it. Hama living poison. 
In all my years of living that's quite something I've never seen before. Sadistic bastard, Naruto muttered, ignoring the pain and getting up onto his feet. Um Lord Ryujin, do you think I could get a specimen of that, whatever it is in that water sphere? Silverwing asked from her perch. I don't really see why not, Ryujin said. Lord Hamura, he asked. Hum, sure I have little interest in it. Hamura responded as Silverwing quickly flew in front of the blob Hamura had suspended in his hand, and she froze it and quickly grasped at her claws and flew off. What an odd little thing, isn't she? She's can be a handful but she's the best alchemist and frontal scout that Esriseeth has. Ryujin told Hamura, anyway all distractions aside, my friend is here for your help. Although Hamura didn't Naruto understood what he meant before he could ask. The throne room doors opened and a procession of adult dragons, clad in black and red armor, with a crest of a cheetah and a fire dragon, crossing blades. Signaling they were guards of one of Nagapur's noble dragon kin. At the middle of six adult dragons seemed to be a weak-looking, bright red fire dragoness with deep soft purple eyes, and a gold underbelly. Ah, Flare I'm glad you have arrived. Ryujin greeted the noble dragonkin. It's a pleasure as always Prince Ryujin. The fire dragoness said warmly, stopping the middle of the throne room with her guards close beside her. But I do wish you would have told me why you brought me here. She said catching a glimpse of Naruto and the tall pale man with two horns sticking out of his head. I hope it's not another attempted to cure my illness. Flair said figuring out what Ryujin wanted her here for. Naruto could see Ryujin lose his composure as he flinched and reeled back as he was found out. But, Flair. I will not hear it Ryujin. We have been over this many times before what I have cannot be cured, and will never so if you'll excuse Prince Ryujin the first will take my leave. She said rather crass, cutting the meeting short and getting up and leaving a shut down Ryujin in a semi-empty throne room, with the throne doors soon closing behind her. At this point you really should have have known better my lord, Nagafin said. I suppose so, anyway Naruto, Lord Hamura if you could leave me be for now. Ryujin said rather quick before flying off through the throne room doors. Wait what just happened? Naruto muttered. Did I miss something? Not really it is normal around here. Nagafen said, moving over to Naruto and Hamura. Here, Hagafen was holding out the small blue necklace, the necklace Ignites had given him earlier in the week. Oh wait what? Naruto shouted pulling at his necklace and only finding the granny's necklace around his neck. Oops. I found it near the steps where you descended early today, I thought it might belong to you and certainly smelled you on it, the panther said crinkling his nose. Thanks I guess, Naruto said as he took the necklace form Nagafin. Uh do you know where the dragon Spyro is? Naruto questioned remembering his mission. Spyro and Cinder are being held in a tavern in town, Nagafin said as he pulled out a small parchment and a pencil. The orange ninja watched as he scribed something down before handing it to him. This is their location. Naruto took the paper. Thanks. He stood there not really sure if he should leave now or not. Hagafen nudged Naruto's shoulder. Looking up at the older ninja Naruto saw Hagafen motion towards a door, instructing him that it was alright to leave if he wished. Nodded back at him, Naruto took his leave. Running out the door, Naruto found himself standing a room where a female guard was changing into her uniform, just as she started to undress. Both the female guard and Naruto remained motionless for a moment before she started to scream and attack him. Screaming himself Naruto ran out the door he came out of, trying to find the nearest escape route to escape the guard. While this commotions was going o behind them, both Nagafen and Hamura snickered at the young ninja's plight. After a lot of running around, Naruto finally managed to get away from the persistent female. He found himself in a dark alleyway just outside the palace. Slowly stepping out from the shadows, he double-checked to see if the guard was anywhere to be found. Thankfully she wasn't. Taking the piece of paper out, Naruto was just about to head off to find the two of them when suddenly he blacked out. Naruto woke up with a quickly realizing that he was in the white aisle. Naruto I have got some delightful news, Ignatus proclaimed as he walked up to the small ninja. Naruto stood up from the ground, his head pounding for some reason. Rubbing the back of his head Naruto said, what is it? I just found the location of the last summoning scroll, Ignatus said rather solemnly. Naruto's eyes went wide with excitement. 
Really where is it? Ignatus motioned for Naruto to follow him, and brought him to the large crystal once again. It was then that an image of a large city showed up. Several buildings on the outskirts of the town were in ruins, while those closer to the center seemed to be in perfect shape. What is this place? Naruto asked. This is the city of Royodia. This is the last known place of the summoning scroll. It was last held by the pervious king before his passing. Now the council holds it till the princess become older, Ignatus said as the image returned to normal. Well that is cool and all but why did you bring me here? Naruto asked confused as to why he didn't just inform him through the crystal he gave him. Well you see Naruto, there is a slight problem that you needed to hear about. After the recent attack on Ryujin, I dare not speak of this out in public. Ignatus said ominously, even to Ryujin's guardsmen. This gained Naruto's attention. What is it? He asked leaning forwards. I have reasons to suspect that the council has been slightly influenced by the same group of people that sent that wolf after King Ryujin, Ignatus warned. If this is true then it is possible that they have influence all over the realms, he said worriedly. So, it just means, that's the group we just need kick their ass right, so let's go do it. Naruto said eagerly. Ignatus held up a paw. I'm afraid that you must wait for Spyro and Cinder to recover. If you are to fight the council then you will need their help as well. PFF, I'm not afraid of some old geezers, Naruto replied with a smug grin. Yes well, these old geezers, as you put them, are heavily guarded and they are still capable of defining themselves. Not only that but they have the whole area under their control. By attacking them, you will have the whole city to deal with, Ignatus warned. Now Naruto saw the problem they had. Nodding his head Naruto said, Thank you Ignatus, I will see what I can do to help them as soon as I can, he finished bowing to Ignatus. In the midst of bowing Naruto soon felt a fairly strong wing against his back and rain hitting the ground around him and his back. Wait what? Naruto jumped surprised, looking around Naruto saw nothing more than empty streets and the rain and thunder above him, and right in front of him was an old tavern with two crackle torches in front of the door, I hope this is where Spyro is and Ignatus just didn't send me somewhere random. Naruto muttered to himself, grabbing the handle of the door and letting himself in inside the tavern was rather bleak, only a few patrons sat around scattered a roaring fire in the corner, and a simple bartender wiping away at the counter. Ah, Naruto. Naruto looked over and saw Hunter with his arm in a sling and a bandage wrapped around his head covering his left eye. Geez Hunter what the heck happened to you? Naruto asked about Hunter's condition. Hunter soon stopped in front of a nearby door at the end of the hall grasped a small handle, and roughly opened it to a small room, containing two young dragons. There was a silver dragoness that was wrapped around on the floor asleep, nestled tightly to a purple dragon, who was lying down beside her but awake and looking down at her. His attention was quickly drawn to Hunter and the new arrival he had heard about. Naruto stood there idle for a moment mostly out of a sense of fear of the dragoness laying on the floor, but was broken away from his daze as Hunter moved past him. He soon followed into the room closing the door behind him. Naruto this is Spyro and the sleeping one is Cinder. Spyro nodded his head, and with a kind smile on his face he said. Hello Naruto, Spyro replied, trying to stay quiet as not to wake Cinder up. Uh hey, Naruto greeted, feeling a little awkward in doing so. Glad to see that the two of you aren't trying to kill me anymore. Yeah sorry about that, Hunter told us about what happened. We didn't have much control over ourselves, Spyro said, for anything that Cinder and I did, please allow me to apologize for the both of us. Spyro finished, bowing his head to the orange man. There's nothing to feel bad over Spyro it wasn't you or Cinder who did it, it was that deranged mole who had power over you with that staff. Hunter said trying to help Spyro away from his guilt. Hey what the hell did happen to that jerk? Naruto said barely remembering the mole. He is being dealt with as we speak, but let's not worry about him. Hunter said, what matters now is we get going to Warfang in the morning, the guardians must be dying to see the two of you alive. As is the rest of Warfang, Spyro merely nodded before glancing back down at Cinder. Spyro wasn't sure if he was ready to head back to Warfang. He and Cinder only just woke back up since they were trapped and memories of their fights against Malefor were still fresh in his mind. He would rather spend the next couple of weeks just relaxing. 
He let out a tired sigh, knowing he didn't have much choice in the matter. The guardians needed to know what happened to them. Well I guess that's where we part ways then, Naruto said. Really why so Naruto? Hunter asked. Ignatus told me of a scroll I'm after, and it lays in a place called Royotia I think he said. Naruto said, and it's the whole reason I came to this world, to become stronger and fill a promise to a friend of mine. Wait Ignatus what do you mean? Spyro questioned, but tried to restrain himself as to not wake Cinder. Ignatus died in the ring of fire how can he be alive? Yes that's what I thought as well. Hunter said, Naruto how do you know of the former fire guardian? Well he's the first one I met when I got here. Naruto explained, I was just watching a group of dragons flying overhead then poof I'm in some wired endless library, with a cloaked light blue dragon. Wait but that's the chronicler, did Ignatus become him somewhere along the line? Spyro wondered aloud. Well he did give me this crystal to keep in contact with me. Naruto said holding it out, shooting from Naruto's hand it floated in the middle of the room, and began to speak. No Spyro, I did not become him, I succeeded him. Out from the crystal an image appeared showing Ignatus as the current chronicler. After you defeated Malefor, the old chronicler called me before him, to pass on the mantle of the old age to the beginning of a peaceful one. He stated then Ignatus gained a sullen look. Spyro, I am sorry how I left you, and I'm sorry for how long it took me to find you, regret filled the elder dragon's voice. I left you feeling variable, but at the same time you gained the love of another to help support you where I had failed, glancing at Cinder's place curled around Spyro. Spyro merely smiled, just nodding it was a lot to take and he wanted to avoid waking Cinder as much as he could. Now, I am sorry Spyro, but right now reunions will have to wait. But for what reason? Spyro asked lowly, I sense a darkness Spyro one that refuses to die, as even though Malefor has been sealed away, his armies still plague the realms. Ignatus said, then out of the crystal a hologram was projected onto the ground, showing seven pedestals with figures on them. Malefor had seven dark generals at his command, three fell in the years close to his resurrection, then you Spyro free Cinder from his control and killed Gwal. But now three remain and they seek to free their master. Do you know anything about those three? Naruto asked. Sadly no I do not, their very evil seems to keep themselves hidden from most of my records and my sight. So I ask you Spyro to accompany Naruto as this scroll may help us deter the coming darkness. But I don't understand Malefor's gone is that not enough? No Spyro it's not, Ignites said grimly, Malefor's darkness is in a class all its own, one that refuses to retreat even among the brightest lights. Sounds a lot like the Uchiha clan, Kurama muttered within Naruto's mind, but Naruto just ignored the beast. But, now that you and Cinder have been found and with the appearance of our new friend, I believe that a new set of events have been set in motion that I can neither see nor control have begun, dark times are coming and you will both be needed. Ignatus finished and with that said the crystal stopped glowing and dropped to the floor once again but was quickly caught by Naruto wanting to not forget it a second time. Rax convoy back to Arimus. Damn that Ryujin he always has to make things more complicated than they have to be. Rack roared into the skies in frustration, walking alongside his two armored escorts as they silently followed him. I can help you with that young prince of Arimus, a hidden figure said startling both Rack and his two escorts, then out of nowhere a being cloaked in a hood and robe seemed to just appear in front of them. And just who the hell do you think you are? Rack yelled with a mix between fear and anger. Don't worry prince Rack the first am just a friend. The being said with much delight as an eerie smile showed bright white teeth within the hood. A friend who has the same bout with the ruler of Esriseeth, the king of Nagapur, Ryujin. Rak couldn't tolerate his presence for a moment more and blew a torrent of fire at him, the being just kept smiling and wound out a dagger of his cloak and sliced the fire with it immediately snuffing out the flame and the bolted right towards Rak. Rak guards drew their swords and charged. The being never lost his smile. He caught the sword of the first guard between his fingers and snapped it in half, jumping away from his broken weapon. The being grabbed the broken tip and slung it at the guard and nailed him right in the head, dropping him dead onto the ground below him. The second guard got behind the being believing he had taken him off guard. Slashing the being and his cloak in half, but quickly realized he was wrong as the cut in half robe fell to the ground without any occupant. Wait what? 
The guard said stunned holding his sword out to the side. Looking for someone, a voice behind him asked with a very sickly sweet voice. Slowly turning around to in the guard saw a panther standing on the tip of his sword, he felt a chill run though his veins as the panther delivered a crushing kick to the back of his head slamming the guard into the ground promptly killing him. Now that we have some tension out of the way maybe we can chat now. The panther said, this was one of the few times in his life Rack had felt fear of anyone he always thought he was above everyone else, and this panther had snuffed out his fire and killed both his guards with little effort and he would have to be careful lest it happen to him as well. Fine then, what do you want to converse to me? Rack said irritated, and trying to keep himself clam at the same time. Very well Prince Rack, allow me to introduce himself I am Pardis. Pardis introduced himself as he bowed to the young fire dragon king. I hear that King Ryujin has refused Prince Anorak's attempts to take the unruled lands of Crestfall into his care. Rak cringed as the panther called Ryujin a king and merely called him a lowly prince. I care little for your name now what do you want? Rak was about to lose his temper. I'm just here to give you a little warning is all, Pardis said. Did you know that Ryujin has figured out how to use Jiwain as a weapon? He said his smile increasing statement puzzled Rack and drew him away from his irritation. TCH, don't make me laugh, that thing is nothing more than an old relic a statue it is no weapon. Oh is it not, Pardis said, then my boy do tell me what these are because I don't know then. Pardis said holding up his pair of daggers. Rack looked at the pair of daggers for only a moment and his eyes widened in realization of what they were. Those are the... Rack tried to say but could find the words. Yes the daggers of Lethan. Pardis told him, a wicked smile still gracing the panther's face. I stole them from the dragon emperor's palace myself. Rack despite his arrogance was no fool he knew the legends behind most of the relics that were in the cities. And he knew that these daggers were said to be the bane of elemental dragons by a single starch could banish one dragon's element. How did you manage such a thing? Rack questioned roughly. He he he, all in due time Prince Rack all in due time. Pardis said smiling, and then in a moment the panther vanished into thin air just as fast as he appeared. Hastily looking around Rack couldn't find a single trace of the smiling panther aside from his dead body guards. Rack merely looked at their corpses and just seething through his teeth as he flew away. From a nearby tree line Pardis watched as Rack flew off smiling to himself knowing that the seeds of chaos have now been planted in Rack's being but this smile was broken when he felt a presence appear behind him. Ah, Galvard how did the mission to kill Ryujin go? Pardis inquired. Not well General Pardis, as I tried to kill Ryujin two unknown beings, interfered with my attack. Two unknown beings, Pardis semi asked but waved it off. Even if there was interference with you task I didn't expect you to beat him anyway. He heard a distanced snarl from behind him. Then why have me waste my time on him? That is barely your concern, but if you want to know let's just say our master wanted to test him, and soon the main trial will start. Pardis said with glee, as he watched Rack disappear into the horizon. Now I need you to do something else for me, Pardis said with glee, turning toward Galvard. Back in Nagapur, the talk with Ignatus had ended and everyone had fallen asleep, though as he slept Naruto tossed in his bed. A night sky of endless stars filled Naruto's vision. Gazing around Naruto found himself in place of strange trees and a field of soft grass blowing in the breeze in the middle of it all were four stone pillars and a large number of chains cascading down onto one spot. Naruto felt drawn to it began to walk toward it, but just after three steps a dark silhouette of a massive dragon appeared in front of Naruto roaring, launching the ninja back from his dream into the real world. Naruto awoke in a cold sweat. What the heck was that about? Naruto muttered wiping away his sweat. Looking around Naruto saw both Hunter and Spyro dead asleep, but Cinder was absent from the room. Where's the other one? Naruto wondered. Getting out of his bed in only his pants Naruto wandered over to the window in the room and could see the early morning sun marred barely peeking over Nagapur wall. As he looked Naruto heard a feminine voice breathe deeply outside. Peeking his head out the window Naruto caught sight of Cinder sitting out on the roof, who in turn caught sight of him. You're Naruto right? She questioned, Naruto simply nodded. How did you know my name, I thought you were asleep during that. Naruto said steeping out onto the roof. Cinder shook her head, 
Nope not really I'm not a heavy asleep like Spyro and Hunter are. She said. So are you really here from another world? Eh yeah, I'm from a place called the Land of Fire. Naruto said, looking out into the sunrise over Nagapur wall. Cinder frowned before asking, is the land always on fire? She questioned. Naruto laughed and shook his head. No it's just called that because the people in our country have the will of fire within us or something like that. The leader of our village explained it to me one time, but it was a long time ago, and I don't think I was paying too much attention to Master Aruka at the time. Cinder nodded her head, the slightest chuckle reaching her voice, as she understood now. So, what do you think so far of our world? She asked, quickly changing the subject as to learn more of the boy beside her. Well when others are not trying to kill me, I guess you could say that I really like this place, though I do personally prefer my home. Naruto replied, I can understand that, I bet you miss your friends and family, Cinder said. My friends yes, I miss them a lot, though I can wait as long as I have to. As for my family, well I never knew them, Naruto continued, I've been an orphan my entire life, I never knew who my parents were. Upon hearing this Cinder felt her head droop. I'm sorry to hear that Naruto, Cinder said sympathizing with the orange human. Both me and Spyro have never met our parents, though Spyro was found and raised by a group of dragonflies. I on the other hand never really had anyone throughout the entire time I was young, till I met Spyro. What? Naruto asked in a bit of disbelief only for Cinder to nod her head. But how is that possible? You should have had at least have made one friend. Cinder merely shook her head. Both I and Spyro have our own stories as to how we grew up, but either way, we never met our real parents. Nor did I have any friends. Naruto stayed quiet for a few seconds as he possessed what Cinder just told him, before asking, how come? Cinder was reluctant at first for telling the orange ninja her story at first, but since we did help free her, and since there was no chance that she affected his life when she was enslaved, she figured she could tell him a little about what she used to be. Well, both of us were taken to the dragon temple when we were eggs, when a dragon named Malefor was wreaking havoc among the dragon realms, so as in precaution the dragon eggs were gathered in one place to keep them safe, but Malefor knew about this and sent an army of apes to attack the temple. He had two goals in mind for the eggs, one to smash all the eggs ensuring the death of the next purple dragon the only one who could challenge him and find an egg that would be easy enough for him to control as his puppet. Cinder sighed, hating the feeling she got reliving her memories. But out of Malefor's plan two dragons came out of it alive, Spyro who was saved by the fire guardian Ignatus, and me who Malefor enslaved for nine long years before Spyro saved me. I was forced to serve as one of Malefor's dark general, and I was ordered to commit many act of evil in his name. Cinder continued, and as a result of those actions taken by Malefor to control me, many blame me for his actions and many use it as a reason to hate me. Not that I can blame them really. Cinder finished muttering the last part. Well I can't say I have a past like that, Naruto said slightly confused by how such a thing could possibly have happened. Ah there you two are. Hunter said poking his head out the window, interrupting the concentration. Come on we need to discuss the journey ahead, he said before ducking back in. Both stood still for a moment as they looked at one another and silently figured that they end that conversation for now before getting up and returned to the room where Hunter was standing over a table looking at a map, and Spyro had just got up himself and was stretching. So what's the plan? Naruto asked, looking at Hunter. Well, I'm not too familiar with this part of the world let alone Esriseeth but from what I can tell our best path to Royodia would be crossing Arimus's countryside, Hunter said. It would be a three-day journey if this map is correct, the cheetah stated. We'll need to get the appropriate supplies and clothing for you and armor for Spyro and Cinder. Hunter continued noting Naruto ruined clothing and the need for Spyro and Cinder to have armor. Eh ya, yeah, I kinda forgot about that. Naruto laughed sheepishly forgetting completely about his missing sleeve and countless other cuts on his outfit. So for now let's go, before the marketplace and blacksmith quarter get too busy, Hunter said rolling up the map and putting it into his pack. What's a blacksmith quarter? Spyro questioned. You don't know what a smith is? Naruto asked rather shocked, even when he was younger he knew what a blacksmith was. Well I've never really stayed in a large city for too long I've always been out in the countryside or fighting. Spyro said looking back at Naruto. 
It's a place where metalworkers tend to congregate to sell their wares whether it's custom or standard wares. Hunter explained. And luckily enough for us a smith I know makes her rounds through this country during this time of year and hopefully we'll be able to catch her. Hunter finished. Lord Ryujin. A soldier came stumbling into the throne room covered in scarred over wounds and grievous cuts, and a horrid smell of decay and death emanated from the injured solder. Ryujin from atop his throne gazed down at the soldier with piercing eyes, shock filled Ryujin's mind and a chill ran down his spine as he thought about what would have happened. What happened to you soldier? Ryujin demanded to know rising from his throne shaking in anger as he looked upon his subject. It's the Arimus army, the private said shaking, they, they came just across the border taking one outpost after another, when they reached 24 before we knew it we were overwhelmed, the captain sent me off as fast as I could straight back to Nagapur, so I could warn you. As this was transcribed to him Ryujin gritted his teeth. Ryujin thought he was making some sort of headway with his talk with Rack as he left the other day, he was a fool, now he knew why Rack had agreed to any type of negotiation. It was to simply distract him as he moved his army towards Esriseth. Ryujin's claws grasped the ground under them cracking and nearly crumbling the stone they were made of. Before the private could explain any more Ryujin sighed and raised his claw and silenced him. Thank you private, with this warning we won't have to lose any more lives, no one else will die. Ryujin spoke. Nagafin. Yes Lord Ryujin. Nagafin bowed, get this solder some food and rest and bandage him up he's done enough for now. Ryujin spoke in a chillingly clam tone. Of course sir. Nagafin bowed and proceeded to help the scout out. Silverwing. Ryujin roared out. In an instant the silver eagle appeared and landed near to Ryujin nervously. Go to the town lords and generals scattered across Esriseth, tell the general to the north and near the Arimus Esriseth border to prep their forces and begin to watch for movement from the Arimus army and repose to it accordingly, and to the south tell them to gather 25% of soldiers stationed at each town and to send them towards Nagapur. Ryujin demanded of Silverwing. Of course Lord Ryujin. The eagle tried to keep her composure, slightly shaking to which Nagafin sighed as he escorted the scout out of the throne room, very quickly followed by the eagle. Ryujin sighed once more as the throne room sat empty, so it has finally begun. The battle between two who hold ideals stronger than themselves shall do battle in the coming days. Rack my old friend I honestly had wished to avoid this not only for the sake of the realms but your sake is my old friend. Ryujin muttered to himself. But I suppose nothing can be done to avoid this now. Ryujin eyes glowed slightly, outside the great dragon that resided above Nagapur I glowed faintly. Equals backquote backquote equals. Dollar percent carrot. Plus. Plus asterisk asterisk plus 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 sad face. Arimus one of the most ancient cities in the dragon realms sat atop a volcanic dome, surrounded by a ring of molten rock with only a single bridge connecting it with the outside world unless one was a fire dragon and could resist the toxic volcanic gas that emanated from the ring. Buildings made of ash and obsidian huddled close together, making the most of the space on the tiny island. High above the city hovered shards of some long past artifact that once helped great power. Lord Rack do you really believe it was wise sending an army towards Esriseth? An elderly mole asked as Rack sat on the balcony overlooking the city, looking bored as he played with the stone tablet that the panther had handed to him in their encounter, running a claw along its strange engravings. Hum, don't worry yourself with it Garanok, this war has been coming whether we wanted it or not. The tablet showed a dim blue glow as Rack played with it. This war is a battle of ideals of who can play the realm unifier better me or Ryujin. Rack stated smugly. But what of the other kingdoms? The elder mole, Marnik said as he moved closer towards Rack's side. Eh, none of them will really be a problem. Royodia is ruled by a council now and keeps our old friend away from her royal duties, they simply don't allow her to be anything more than a figurehead, Gur isn't much better in this regard he decided to keep his country out of the political turmoil of the realms long ago, and Crestfall has no one sitting upon the throne. He said as the stone tablet glowed brightly and he slowly stood up from it looking up towards the shards of his ancient city began to glow the same bright blue and smirking at its glow. And the dragon emperor, Marnik questioned, paying no heed to the glowing stones overhead. The self-proclaimed balance keeper, Rack sneered. Ha, he's got no little to no say so these days with the realms as they are, really the only two are just me and Ryujin, the pawns and other pieces have already fallen astray from the game 
now only the kings remain. Rack finished, as the glow intensified. Percent carat asterisk dollar percent and carat hash dollar percent hash percent hash dollar percent dollar carat and percent dollar carat and asterisk percent carat and asterisk carat percent asterisk percent carat asterisk hash. Dollar hash percent carat hash dollar carat percent percent and carat asterisk and asterisk asterisk oo. The blacksmith quarter of Nagapur was bustling, with the transport of weapons, armor, scrap metal and raw ore. Forges were ablaze as wood was fed into them and ore was refined into finer metal for metalworking later. A smoke cloud rose high above the area fed by several smoke stacks formed the forges and the sound of hammers filled the air as metal was worked into weapons and armor. Man there's nothing like this in Konoha, Naruto said excited, while looking around at the many blacksmith wares. On the other hand, Spyro was tense he had never really been in such a large city with such an overwhelming amount of people. While his home back with the dragonflies could be considered big to actual dragonflies, Spyro never felt the feelings of being in a crowded place, due to the fact that he was much larger than anyone else he knew beforehand. This is your first time inside a populated city aside from Warfang isn't it Spyro? Hunter asked taking notice of Spyro's unease. Yeah in Warfang I was only there when many of the citizens had fled, I've just never really been around so many people who weren't trying to kill me. Spyro said still looking around at the numerous inhabitants. That may be Spyro or is it that you haven't been around a large group other than dragonflies? Cinder teased looking at Spyro with a smirk. Spyro stumbled a little at Cinder's comment, but before he could respond. Hey no touching. A blacksmith yelled at Naruto who was holding a blade quickly the ninja dropped the blade apologized and took off. So Hunter you said that you know someone here. Spyro asked trying to draw away from his unease. Yes, she's an apprentice to a metalworker, who would stop by my village with her master as they made their rounds around Abler, Hunter said as they pushed through the crowd of the blacksmith quarter. I know that the two of them stop by here for materials and do light work before they head back across the sea towards Abler. Wait we're across the sea? Spyro questioned, casting a puzzled look at him. Yes, I'm not entirely sure how we got here but as far as I do know that scout, what was her name? Hunter asked himself, Silverwing I believe it was, she brought us here using some sort of spell but of what sort I really don't know. Aside from wandering about, that we're going to be on a rather long journey, Cinder take Naruto and Spyro to see if you can find a good armor smith around here and get fitted. Hunter suggested, Hum, alright but where did Naruto get off to? Cinder asked, before catching sight of him at a nearby stand taking a wide-eyed look at a couple of swords. That's fine and all but we don't have any currency to trade for. Don't worry about. Hunter said as took a pouch off of his belt. Silverwing left this with us, said it was a gift from Lord Ryujin. He said handing to her, after he did Cinder opened the pouch with one of her claws and showed five fine cut glowing gems on the inside. Cinder's eye went wide during her time under mail for she never needed any type of currency but she was familiar with how much this was. What did she say it was for? Spyro asked Hunter. No, but I can assume Ryujin means it is a thanks for you two defeating mail for, Hunter told them. So are you gonna keep looking for this friend of yours? Cinder asked hanging the pouch on one of her wing tips. For the moment yes, now if you'll excuse me. Hunter turned and left the two dragons with the orange ninja, who was still bugging some nearby blacksmiths. Come on Spyro let's collect our saver and go find some armor. Cinder said halfway sarcastic, before walking towards Naruto. Spyro just glanced at the nearby ninja and just walked with Cinder. Hey Naruto, Cinder called gaining the ninja attention, drawing him away from a weapon case he was looking at. Come on we're getting us some armor and we might as well get you something else to wear aside from that ripped rag. Cinder said as Naruto came over to them. Huh, Naruto had completely forgotten about his outfit since he came to the dragon realms with a torn off sleeve numerous rips and blood, it was a wonder why no one was paying him more attention, Naruto simply only wore a sheepish smile after finally noticing. You really are dense aren't you Kit? Kurama muttered inside Naruto's head, to which Naruto didn't responded but did sweat drop. I guess I've been way too distracted since I got here. Naruto told them. So anyone around here who can make armor for me? Naruto asked jokingly. Cinder smirked lightly, and Spyro was just puzzled by Naruto's words. 
percent dollar carrot and dollar hash carrot hash dollar percent dollar carrot percent dollar carrot percent carrot hash percent and percent carrot hash dollar carrot dollar carrot hash carrot percent dollar hash dollar percent hash dollar carrot thirty five thousand six hundred forty five after about an hour of wandering around many blacksmiths had turned down their requests despite how much they would be paid or many had just ignored them stating how much work they already had to do what do you mean you're too busy naruto gritted his teeth together starting to become very annoyed at the repeated answer look lord ryujin has conspired all the blacksmiths into the service of s receipts military word of invasion has spread around the town the blacksmith mole said so what you're saying is there's probably no one who can help us spyro asked sorry all of us are in the esser well the mole trailed off a bit what cinder asked well there is garanok he's a blacksmith he's not conspired like the rest of our but he isn't a people person he never takes any business and just ignores most if not everyone who comes to him the mole said turning back to his work now leave me be the group quickly left the building once outside naruto said man what a jerk what's his problem anyways it's not hard to miss that things are tense around here it almost gives the air a heavy feeling cinder commented yeah i suppose you're right naruto replied shrugging this comment off noting the heavy atmosphere of the quarter let's just find this garanok quickly then spyro requested wanting to get a move on like the mole said garanok was rather close by however they didn't expect his house to be in such ruins the whole thing looked like it could fall apart by the slightest of gusts of wind the wooden structure looked like it has been standing there for years the wood was faded splintering and parts of it was missing entirely the only reason why they knew this was the place was because there was an old wolf hammering away at a sword that and there was a sign above which in faded near unreadable lettering garanich's workshop cinder took a step forwards to address him excuse us are you garana scram garanok said interrupting her naruto rolled his eyes rather fed up with the rudeness of the people in this town please sir it's very important spyro pleaded the wolf let out a rather annoyed sigh before he looked over to the group what do you want he asked with his gravelly voice we need armor for myself and cinder spyro stated answering the question for the others garanok rolled his eyes i have no time waste on such worthless pursuits he went back to hammering i quit custom orders years ago there's nothing you have worth my time what about a bag full of fine cut gems cinder said hoping to tempt the old grizzled wolf without much of a response the wolf silently stopped hammering and turned slightly to face the dragoness how many he asked and cinder tossed him the bag catching it he looked inside and found the five glowing gems fine i'll do it but my work isn't worth this much he said as he removed one of the gems slipping into his pocket and tossing the rest back to cinder all right now let me give you two a good look over garanok said as he put his work aside to come look over as he did he took more notice of naruto the hell happened to you garanok questioned harshly meaning naruto torn garb and noticed a small metal knife hanging slightly off of his person t guess i have to work on you to don't i whatever the hell you are he said yeah sorry all right i'll look you over after these two he told him plain before heading over to spyro first okay first things first extend your wings to your fullest doing as told spyro spread his wings till the nearly were stiff garanok swept his eyes across the wings for no more than five seconds before giving spyro a sign to relax and they gave spyro a quick look over starting at his head poking at measuring a few others things and asking him to move his tail back and forth a few times hum well okay then i'm gonna need you to do the same young dragoness garanok said to cinder as he finished with spyro with cinder nodding in response after he looked over her wings and moved to her head his eyes immediately locked on the marking on her head and paid special attention the marking across her body to which cinder noticed and could guess what he was thinking about so when will you be needing this armor garanok asked well we don't have that much time spyro told him i had a feeling that was the case garanok said as he picked through a pile of thrown away scrap metal picking out several pieces taking several large ones out and tossed them into an empty pot over a searing fire nearby okay i have what i need for your order 
but there is something else I need done, so what are your names? Um Spyro sir. The purple dragon said and the eyes of the smith looked to Cinder. It's Cinder. The silver dragoness said. Hum, very well I'll need both of you to fetch a shipment of blood ore from a local miner he lives about a mile outside of the blacksmith quarter next to the local pilgrim's rest. If you get lost just ask most around getting to where I need you to go won't be hard now off with you. Garanok hurried the two dragon off without much of a word and turned back to his forge in Naruto. Okay let get started on you then, and I apologize ahead of time, this will be more or less of a quick thrown together item concerning you guys are in a hurry. The old wolf said as he came over to Naruto, kneeling down and looked him over with a stern eye. Garanok measured his arms legs and poking around a bit. Hem you seem similar in stature to most field cheetahs, well with that no this'll be a little quicker. Finishing with the young ninja Garanok went over and took a few pieces of what seemed to be leather, out of case that had steam pouring out of it. Taking the pieces of leather, Garanok began cutting and stitching together the pieces of leather, Garanok worked silently for about 30 minutes and in that time came out with a leather cuirass pauldrons and some padding for his upper legs. Here try this on, Garanok tossed Naruto the pieces of leather armor. Putting the pieces of armor on the leather armor fit pretty well. Something, kinda feels off with this stuff, Naruto said trying to get a feel for the armor. Well I can't make it perfect, I could do a lot better if I had time, but sounds like you will be taking off rather quickly. Garanok said, beginning to work on Cinder's and Spyro's armor Naruto watched as the smith focused on his work his eye carefully scanning the surfaces of each piece and beginning sure each piece would serve its purpose well. When he was done the armor produced was a dull gray iron, helmet, chest piece, two front bracer and two back and one covering the tailbone of a dragon. As Naruto watched Garanok finish up with the dragon's armor his hand fell to his kunai pouch and feeling around for a second Naruto pulled out a lone kunai. Damn I guessed I used the last of what I had with me against that wolf guy. Naruto frowned and tossed the kanai in the air a couple of times, before an idea formed in his. Hey Mr. Garanok, Naruto said excited, what, the old wolf asked plainly, as he got the dragon armor finished. Do you think you can make me a couple copies of this? Naruto asked holding out the kanai to him, taking the kanai form Naruto Garanok examined it. Yes I could. What the hell do you use this for anyway? Garanok asked, tossing the kanai in his hand a few times he grasped it firmly and threw it at a post. That was pitiful. Garanok said as he pulled it out. Do you use this as a throwing weapon or melee? Garanok asked. Both. Naruto answered him. This weapon is pathetic for either of those. Garanok said as he tossed it again. The design allows for too much weight as the focus of it being thrown and for using it for melee combat you might as well just stab yourself with it and save the enemy the trouble of having to kill you. But that's a standard ninja tool. Naruto complained to Garanok but the wolf ignored it. Don't care what it's supposed to be. Garanok said as he walked further into his shop to pick out different metals for the armor. I've seen plenty of crap in my days to know what bad craftsmanship is. When I'm done with these I'm going to show you what real metal work is. Garanok went to work smelting and crafting, what looked like to Naruto a kunai at least the bottom half did, as Garanok crafted it the blade of it became much thinner than the kunai Naruto had shown him. Finishing Garanok turned and handed Naruto the new blade it had the same grip and ring on the bottom half, but the blade was severely different, its shape was now that of a thin feather with a razor sharp edge. Try throwing that. Taking the blade form Garanok Naruto looked at the post Garanok threw his kunai at and did the same. Naruto the blade silently shot through the air as Naruto slung it and as it hit the post it not only pierced it went right through it and into an opposing rock behind, digging into the wall about halfway. Stunned Naruto's mouth hung agape for only a moment, that is awesome can you make more? Naruto asked excitedly, obviously impressed with the old wolf's ability. Yeah, Garanok said and about 30 minutes later Garanok had completed not only the armor but a set of 15 new kunai based on the new one he had made for Naruto, and in that time that Cinder and Spyro had arrived back with a bag of rocks that looked like they were bleeding, to which Spyro seemed to be more than happy to get rid of the strange rocks. Thanks, Garanok said, and proceeded to hand them the armor he had Spyro and Cinder went off to try on the armor, Garanok handed Naruto a dozen new kunai. Naruto was more than happy to take the set of kunai from the old wolf, 
and soon enough Spyro and Cinder had returned wearing the armor Garanok had made for them. How does it feel? The wolf asked. It fits nearly perfectly. How did you manage by just looking at us in such a short time? Spyro asked amazed how the armor fitted and felt the armor the found in their journey was nothing compared to this. You worked at Munitions Forge for a while didn't you? Cinder asked, amazed by the work herself. Never mind, Sir Garanok thank you for your work but we must get going. Cinder finished bowing to him. You're welcome, now quit bugging me. Garanok said as he turned around and proceeded to work in another of his projects. Taking that as a K to leave the three left with their new armor and armaments and made their way back to Hunter, who was waiting in the same spot they had separated at, but now had a several bags each one filled with provisions for each one of them to carry. So how long will it take to get Royodia? Naruto asked as Hunter passed him a bag to carry. Normally it'd be a five-day walk form what a guide told me, but I was informed of a cavern system that could cut that into two in half instead. Hunter told them. Though it does go through an ancient underground cemetery supposedly haunted, but I'm sure that guide was being more than superstitious. He finished handing over the bags, at the word of haunted Naruto felt his blood run cold. But for now let's get over of the city I want us to get as far as we can before nightfall. And with that the group set out towards the city's gate and furthermore Royodia, though unaware of the strife and horror that was brewing on the borders of Esriseth and soon reach Nagapur not long after their departure. The End Thanks for watching, also remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.